I'm Dave Crane. I'm Dave Crane. Welcome to day two of Chef Talks here at Gulf Food. Behind me you can see the lounge and uh, right behind me now you can see the arena where I'm going to be talking to uh, some of the biggest and best chefs from around the world. Now the biggest challenge is when you're running a room like this is you can't really uh, do what you used to do which builds up a big atmosphere. If you can see what I can see now there's about 20 chairs in a room that should have taken about 100, 150 people. In the good old days, they'd be stacked up, but things are very different now. But the great thing is I'll be sharing with you all the different interviews, all the insights, and all the things that I get to learn from the many chefs that come through to talk to me here at Chef Talks. So just look online and make sure that you do that. If you miss anything, then go to my YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the bell, and it'll ring and let you know as soon as I'm going live with anything else. Meanwhile, hang around, enjoy, this is Chef Talks, and here we are live from Gulf Food. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you. Welcome to Chef Talks. My name is Dave Crane. Uh, I've been given the wonderful job of hosting uh, this room and getting to meet some of the most incredible people in the culinary world. Uh, everyone from master chefs to people working in the, the, feed, well, the feeding industry, feeding into restaurants and so on. And uh, for the next three days, we've had one day already, uh, I would really recommend that you hang around here to see where the industry is going and connect with some of the world's greatest practitioners as well. So, I've just been having a sneaky peek at something, which when you see it, you'll probably feel the same way as me. Your jaw will drop, and you go, wow, that is brilliant. And so I'm gonna waste no more time talking. I think we need to hear from the master himself, when he shares with us his views, his ideas, and the reinvention of food. Yes, seriously. As we bring on our first guest of the day, please put your hands together for Mr. Norbert Niederkopfler. Let me do this again. Mr. Norbert Niederkopfler. There you go. Suddenly, as I said it, I went, no, it starts with a K, but it's not Niederkopfler. Now, the thing is, before we start talking, this here, and I've got to stand back and let you see it, this is like, imagine that the zombies took over the world and you had to hide somewhere and you needed a guide to survive. This is all you need. It's absolutely incredible. Can you explain what this is, please? Uh, good morning, everybody. This is uh, a book which came out uh, a couple of months ago. It's called Cook in uh, 2008. So, in uh, at the uh, 12th. We started to work on a concept which is called Cook the Mountain. So it's all about the mountain. We are just using products from the mountain. We have uh, no other supplier. We have 40 to 50 different types of farmers. They work directly for us, so no middlemen. We go there, we talk to them very directly, and so they really get good money out of it. And uh, what we are doing, we, are, we live, we are located in San Casiano, which is a small village in the Dolomites. And uh, it's on 1,700 meters 
over the sea level. So we are not working any vegetables which come out from a greenhouse. We are not working any olive oil. We are not working any citrus. We have no plastic. We use just the plastic what we have to use by law. And especially we have a no waste concept. So also with the meat, fish, we use everything. So there's absolutely no waste. This is very important and so also when we did the book we were studying a lot uh, with my sous chef, he's uh, preparing over here and uh, I have a private collection of around 1,800 to 2,000 cookbooks from all over the world and uh, we were doing research for more than two months to see what we don't want to do in the book because there's plenty of books and uh, nobody in the world needs another book but uh, we decided to, do, to show what we do. And so the, the book is totally done with the... Uh, Before you talk, talk about that book, let me just illustrate how important is the stuff you just said. So let's get this right. So you are saying that with a restaurant, the concept is you don't have anything important. It only comes from the sustainable things around you, including if you can't get access to olive oil, there will be no olive oil. And everything is completely and utterly sustainable. Now to do that, before we go to the book, because the book is incredible, can I just illustrate the fact that you are three star Michelin chef? So you're, that effectively is like being Yoda in the, in, the, in the food world. So that means reinvention and creating your own way of doing it. In terms of how you decided to do this, what was the journey that made you decide that we will make everything come from scratch? We're not going to have anything important. Why did you do that? When we were in 2007, the first uh, restaurant in the northern part of Italy, especially in the mountains with two Michelin stars, with a totally different type of cuisine. So we did, uh, we were famous for quagra, we were famous for flying the product from all, all over the world. So we were flying in uh, Finland, potatoes from Australia, we were flying from Montezoys from Japan, we were flying Kobe beef from all over the world. And then uh, I, I said, well, it doesn't make any sense. We have uh, guests from all over the world. We give them exactly what they can eat in Dubai, what they can eat in London, what they can eat in New York. And so I said, no, it doesn't make any sense. And then we started to really to rethink everything. And then in 2010, my first son was born. And I said, well, I mean, we have to take responsibility for our kids. I mean, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with those numbers. When we go on like we do now, today, we have 50 harvests left. That's it. Then, what is done? Hold on. Rewind that again. There's 50 yeah. harvests left. Yes. And then what the, the world is done? Because we have no... Uh, when you work with, uh, with the normal way, with the biodiversity, like we are working, that you have all the different types of products. So, then from then on till 50 years, we have natural products. After this, it's all greenhouses, it's all, so it's, it's no, uh, no natural food anymore. It's all made food. Especially, you know, we have a big problem with uh, our water resource, we have a big problem with our land, we have a big problem because, I mean, like when you see in Germany, you have a lot of parts which are desert already now. So we've got the, the climate change of the world and it, it happens a lot. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on, but then you have to, to take more land away from the forest, you have to take more land away. And uh, the problem is when you do monoculture, like uh, most of the big companies do, you are running out of, of, of soil. Because the soil is around 30 centimeters, it's, it's real healthy for soil, and you're running out of it. And so when you do monoculture, you can use the soil for two, three, four years, that's it, and then it's done. It's a fact there's fewer and fewer free spaces on the planet that haven't actually been built on at this moment in time, so it is a big challenge. Now, you, you were going to talk about this book, and I wanted to illustrate the fact that this book is 100% biodegradable, isn't it? Yes. And it's also edible, which is, yes. well, I mean, not that you want it necessarily, you want to digest it, but, <laughs> but what's it made of then? Now, the, the paper we are using is all apple paper, so it's 100% uh, recycled from the waste of the apple. And the outside here is all apple skin, so it's a leather. It's a vegetarian leather, which now uh, German car companies use also for the interior. And so it's more and more, and more going in that direction, you can do it. And uh, the area where we are from is uh, 
it's very famous for the apple, so that is third apple, which is sourced in Europe, comes from there where we are. So in terms of this book, this book, it was shown you the whole kit. It all comes together, and this is like a survival kit, what, for restaurants or for, for, for villages? Who would, who would want this book? Well, no, it's, uh, you can use those for home, but it's just it shows you that you can run a restaurant in a totally different way. So uh, it was built up in the full season, but we have to, uh, every season, we have to, uh, to do this. So we have to work in spring for the next winter because, you know, when you live in the mountain, it's different than, than when you live on the seaside. Because in the mountains, four months or five months per year, you have nothing. But like now, we have 15 degrees minus in the morning, and we have a half a meter to meet the snow still there, still covering everything. So nature is sleepy. And uh, when we start, and it's very complex, the whole story, because you have to work in altitude and in latitude. The altitude is when we start uh, the restaurant in San Casiano, 1,700 meters over sea level. We have to go to places like Merano, which is a city close by, which is around 150 kilometers away from us. And it's much lower. They have a Mediterranean, uh, uh, how do you say, Mediterranean climate. So we can go there because nature starts before there. And uh, latitude is because if you have ever seen one part, so if you have one farm a year, Maybe you have a very bad summer that you have hail or you have really bad weather and then you're running out of products. So that's why you have to work in all different types of farmers and all different types of countries. And it's very interesting. And so we are just doing this what we wrote in 2008, as I said before. When you decide that you're going to create an ecosystem like this book, with all, and you gave me a sneak peek earlier, and it's got things to fill in and things to decide, so I guess this is transferable to anywhere around the world. If you work your way through this, you should be able to set up an ecosystem. Well, this is the reason why we were talking about when we cook the mountain, it's, uh, it's done in 2008 because we are living in the mountain. But uh, uh, the second title of this book is The Nature Around You. So this is very important, this is probably the most important uh, words in here. Because uh, when you work with, uh, with just with what you find around you, so we are working on a project now in Venice, which is called Cook to Lagoon. So we use everything just from the lagoon. But uh, the great thing is that you are maintaining the old cultures, because we, we didn't invent anything new. So when we see today, it was already done. So we just relearned how to use products, we relearned how to store the product because like in winter time you have uh, I mean usually 99% of the of the people in the world they work with maybe 20 to 40 different types of vegetables. We work with uh, from 400 to 500 different types of vegetables, wild herbs and mushrooms. So it is a totally different way in the university. Those are our farmers we control them so that they are not putting any pesticides, they are working just in a natural way. So you have to work it in a different way. You know, maybe plant uh, the tomatoes in summertime this year. On this side of the, of the field, next year you, you move it to the other side so that the soil has always time to recover. So this is very interesting. So that's why when you work in this way, you don't need any pesticides. You're just working with a natural way as they used to do it in the old days. And the soil is almost the same consistency. What well, I find fascinating about this whole ecosystem, though, is not just the brilliance of putting together this system, but it must have been a big marketing campaign. Is this on? Let's check this for Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. It must have been an incredible marketing campaign to turn around to all the farmers and suppliers and say, by the way, you're not going to use pesticides, you're going to work with us exclusively. And so on. Did you have to persuade them that the effort they're going to use for you is going to be used by other people in the region, or do you just disappoint you with a little corner of the field that you want to? No, 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 it's not just corner of the field. Or they, or they marriage the, the philosophy that we have, otherwise, we're not working with them. And, but uh, we share the contact, so we give it also to other restaurants, we give it to private people. And so they, especially now in the last year with the, with the uh, COVID-19, we had a big problem there, and farmers came up to me and said, what do we have to produce for the next year? I said, I don't know, I really don't know, because we don't know what's going on, 
and uh, but we help you to sell it to your the private people. So we gave them the database from our customers, and so now they are they, they, they planted a little bit less, but they sold everything. So this is, uh, and uh, you know the thing is, we are going directly. We have no middleman, and so we give them the money, which usually the, the middleman will. So they get some more money, and now we have, as I said before, you know, from 40 to 50 farmers. These are 90 percent young families. So families maybe farmers around 30, 35 to 40 with young kids. But then they realize how, how important it is for the for the for the for the future. You know, and uh, till now we were just working on the tasty part, but uh, now we are starting to work on the medicine part. You know, like, uh, I don't know if someone knows uh, uh, flowers of Bach, which is all about the medicine part from the, from the herbs, from the white herbs, and this was done in 1200. So it was uh, done by Hildegard von Bingen, which was a, which was a monk, and uh, she was doing it 1200 and she was building this and so now today uh, our kids we, we grow them with, uh, with just natural things and so and food is food is very different you know? food is it's very important you are what you eat and so we realized also with uh, all the all the parts of, of uh, storing products you know of fermentation how healthy this is you know when we are uh, embryos when we are in the developed the say the, the womb Yes, we have one uh, one brain. When we are born, we have two brains. With one part of the brain is in the, in the intestine, and so uh, all the immune system of us is in the intestine. So it's all about food. Oh, absolutely. One, I mean, what you said there. I'm just wondering whether the entire supply industry around the world, the middleman is turning around saying, "Is Norman Dinikopfler is going to ruin our our business model?" Like going directly from farmers to restaurants without anybody being in the middle. Do you get any challenges on that? No, you don't have any challenges on that. You can, I mean, uh, with, a, with a lot of people, they said, I said, don't do it because you are going to lose also your second star. And I mean, we uh, are the first restaurant in the world to get three mission stars with a completely sustainable concept. And you got even the green star, which is new this year. And so around the world, it's around 100. 50, 140 tree stars, and from the tree stars, getting 20 now to get the green star too. So, uh, the movement is going in that direction, especially you know, when you have family, when you have kids, you have to do something. You know? Otherwise, we are running out of products, and this is the biggest problem, you know. And uh, on long term, to feed 7, 8 billion people, you can do it just with small farmers. You can do it, you cannot do it with one branch. It's the biggest problem. You know, all the, the uh, also when you when you start to manipulate too much too much the ingredients, the problem is today we have a lot of problems with the sugar, and you know we have written on a lot of things on no no uh, preservatives, no preservatives, uh, preservatives, but sugar is a preservative. When you see, I mean, do you know how much sugar is in one kilo of tomato ketchup? It's from five to seven hundred grams in one kilo. Wow. We are doing our own tomato ketchup, we, we make it with plums. We do it with fermented plums. We just ferment it with no sugar in us, just the sugar from the fruit. And the kids love it because it's, it's a fruity part, fruity taste, and it's, it's, it tastes like a tomato, uh, tomato ketchup. Sounds delicious. Now you're going to share with us a presentation. Um, do you want to do that now? Yes. So, as I said, you know, the, the restaurant is one restaurant. What we have is, uh, is uh, the Sancto Veritus. It's in uh, San Cassian in Dolomites, uh, 1,700 meters over the sea level. Then, uh, by myself, my company, this is the area where we are. It's just. Uh, Where's your restaurant? I can't see it on there at all. It's really well hidden. You know, a small hand over there is the okay. restaurant. Is, this is just a little bit of the landscape that you see where we are. This is Dolomites. Which is, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is the system of the, which is written in this book, uh, uh, about the, uh, how do you say, the economic system, so the economic world with the terroir, with the, 
the gastronomy, it really fits together. Uh, it just, uh, this is the only thing what we have. So we have great nature, we have great uh, terroir, we have great farmers, so we have to work in this way together because otherwise uh, this is a problem. This is my second restaurant. This is done on 2,300 meters over the sea limits in the ski wow. resort. That looks like it's in space or something. It's yeah, incredible. Yeah, this is in space, yes. And uh, when they asked me to do this restaurant, because on this mountain we have two, two museums. We have the last museum done by Zahadik on 2,300 meters of the sea level, which is a museum from Reinhold Mesner. Reinhold Mesner was the first guy to climb all the peaks of 8,000 meters without oxygen. So he was the first one. When they asked me to do this, this restaurant, I said yes, but I want to have my designer. My designer is, uh, he is from Italy, not a part of Italy, but he lives in London. And he became famous in London with a project which is called 100 Days, 100 Chairs in the Waste of London. So he was walking around in London and uh, just what he found on the streets, what people throw away, he was doing 100 chairs and he, he was uh, named for wallpaper for one of the most sustainable chefs in the world. In, it was around 10 years ago. The very interesting thing is here, we are absolutely clean, so no waste. We have uh, decided to not use any bottles of water, because we did the calculation that we had to bring up on top of the mountain for winter season 36,000 bottles of water with the camp, with the trucks, and then to bring it down again. So we are using a system which is called BWT, Best water technology. We use the water from the mountain, we clean it, we filter it, we mineralize it, and we sell it. But we sell it, and 50 cents per liter we donate to an organization which is drilling for water in uh, Nigeria and in the poorest countries in the world. So this is completely sustainable. From this restaurant, I can point the finger to where the vegetable comes from, where the farmer comes from where the guy comes from who did the lamp, where the, who did the ceiling, and it's all, all done in, in, in a totally sustainable way. Can I take you back to that picture before, before you go to this one? As I'm looking at this incredible yeah. picture, yeah, I see the hand glider, and I'm just thinking, is that where you keep your actual kitchen? So you are on the clouds cooking naturally, and people are watching it. That's just an incredible yeah. picture of the restaurant. Just to, to explain one thing, the ceiling was done by I don't know who knows Loden. Loden is a wool which we are using, which is very warm for winter time. And it was done by a company which uh, is uh, based on uh, Brunico in the city where we are. And it was done by a Japanese core painting technique so that we don't pull it, uh, the water when we, when we do the coloring. Wow. So it was all hand drawn on the loom. And uh, so, really, it was uh, really absolutely clean. And when we go to the next slide, is the book. So this is the, the front of the book. As you see, uh, you know, and then, you know, it's in, in, this was done by my sous chef. And uh, we, we put in more effort to, to show the farmers that we are working with. So it is for every farmer, we, uh, we brought them in. We are talking about what they are doing, about the uh, effort, about all the problems they have, and uh, we give them more space than for ourselves. So this is just all about uh, done by, as I said, by Michele Suido, Lazzarini, my sous chef. My wife, she was writing all the stories, with those stories, so you can really open up, read one story, then close it down, and then you you uh, re, re, uh, take it the next, uh, next days, and then you go on. And in, in this book here is no recipe. All the recipes are in this book here. So there's all the recipes where you can uh, read everything. It's everything written on there. You can also make some notes. Also, this one is all done with uh, the second half of paper. Can I ask you how much it costs to buy a book like this? Because it's heavier than I am, and I'm pretty heavy. Uh, and the system that you've got there with the way you can fold it around and everything yes. is so exquisite. The time it's put into this is just incredible. It's 98 euro. 19 euros? 90, 98 euros. 98 euros, wow. Okay, brilliant. 
This is uh, what we are doing with uh, Young Chef. This is Michele Lazzarini, my sous chef. He is here with me. So today uh, he's uh, uh, yeah he's over there preparing the masterclass. And uh, no, he's not. I've got him. Okay. Yeah. We can't tell all the masks on. It just looks exactly like you on that picture. No offense. And what we are doing, we are working a lot of young people. So he started with me when he was 21. He's 28 now. But uh, in Italy, we have around uh, 20 young chefs working who uh, all were in our team and they have uh, Michelin star restaurants now. They are all working in the same system. As I said before, the nature are you. So when they, were, when they are in Sicily, they are working just products from Sicily. And they are in Puglia, they are just working with products from Puglia. So this was very important to build up the whole, the whole system. And uh, this is the dish that we are preparing today. It's a white fish tartar. But the, the, the idea of the white fish tartar is we, were, we set the fish on the table and we said, okay, we are not stopping before we didn't use everything. So we used uh, the scales, we got really nice scales, and we, we cleaned them, we dried them, we deep fried them. So this is the crunchy part with the skin, because of the skin we use. And uh, bones and heads, we are making a sauce out of it. And from the fish to make it tartare. And uh, the outside is, you know, not using any olive oil. Us. It helps a lot uh, for us because the problem is when you work without greenhouses or when you work with fresh herbs, they can, you can keep them maybe for two, three, four days. That's it. Then all you throw them away. All you put them in the stock in a sauce. We are making oils out of it. And we are working everything with grapeseed oil. The very important thing about the grapeseed oil is the grapeseed oil has no color and has no taste. So this is very important for us. So that we can do really a basil oil which tastes 100% basil. We can do uh, urbana oil which tastes 100% urbana. Because the problem with the olive oil which I love is that it gets a very strong taste. And so when you work well in very delicate products then uh, olive oil is too strong. So the way we have, we have no dishes which we have on the menu every 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 part of the year. So like in winter time we are not using any, any tomatoes. In winter time we have in summertime a salad which is made out of 40 different types of white herbs. And even the the vinaigrette that we are making is made with the kombucha of uh, elderflower. In the winter time when it's, we are not selling it, because we have no white herbs. In summertime, sometimes when it's raining for a week or ten days, we take it off the menu because we don't have the white herbs. So it's all built based on nature. So we are not going to say, okay, next week we are doing this, this, this on the menu. We have to see what nature gives us and then we decide what to put on the menu. Well, that's a bit difficult for printing menus if you don't know what's going to be on it the week before. No, no. Okay, so that's a bit of an adventure for everybody who goes there. But what's been, for instance, and forgive me for saying that white fish tarts are, if it's full of scales and bones, aren't people going to go, eh? Mm -hmm. No? I'm well, just wondering. No, no, we are using the bones and the, the scales. We, as I said, you know, we clean them, we wash them, then we dry them, then we deep fry them. So they are really crunchy. And so this is the crunchy part, you know, because also the dishes, they have to be built up also in the system with yin and yang. So sweet, sour, soft. Crunchy, so it's all like that, like this. Absolutely. Well, my wife's from Singapore. When she eats a fish, it's a different thing from when I eat fish. Because there's so many more bits to it that she enjoys. The meat is going right to finish that. So yeah. I, I understand that completely. This is absolutely brilliant. And so, the, the, first of all, there's two things. I want to ask you another question because I'm really fascinated by where this is going. But also, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions if you've got them for, for Chef Norbert as well. We have a microphone just over there. If anybody would like to put their hand up and join us with the questions, then you're very welcome to because, uh, I mean, you are the, the star amongst all the chefs I know of. And this is incredible, incredible stuff. All this, so impressive. Um, I know there's a lot of people asking about you coming into this room, but they might be shy to ask. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions anyway. Please put your hand up if you want to, and then the microphone is there. I had a great breakfast this morning, so I don't mind. When you have a breakfast, that's another thing. When you eat your breakfast, you go, that's not sustainable, that's not sustainable, or do you just eat it because it's nice? No, at home, we have, uh, I have two kids, and uh, the oldest son now is 10 years old, 
the young one is two and a half. And so we have always, uh, we have some really good uh, bakers there. They do everything with mother dough. And so it's really good. And we have our own father, our own mom, and so it's, it's okay. Yeah, We're but, doing fine. But it must be difficult to travel and eat outside of your restaurant. If you see so many preservatives or the rest of it, and you know what goes into it, you might not want to eat it. Well, you know, I'm not going out to restaurants and to tell them what they have to do. This is a thing what you have to come up by yourself. If you do it, you have to do it 100% and you have to believe in it. Otherwise, it doesn't work out because there's so much work behind. And like all uh, those of my chefs, they go out in the morning and they do foraging and they pick up, uh, like we have this dish on here, we have uh, capers from elderflower. So they are, as you say, it's, it's a seed. And so we have to collect them, we have to put them away, we have them uh, to store them. And so it's a crazy amount of work, but uh, I think, as I said, you know, uh, for me, you know, it's, it would be very difficult for me to stay with my kids and, uh, and one day when my son came up and they said, hey daddy, you really blow it up. And I said, uh, yeah, you are right. So it would, uh, this is what's, what's, the, what's the reason why we went this way. And, and as I said before, you know, there were, when we started with this concept, everybody said to me, you are completely crazy. But now we see that we have a lot of young chefs and we have only young chefs they are really convinced about this. But I tell them, hey, listen guys, it's your future. I mean, I'm 60 years old, and so, I'm, you know, it's, it's, I'm in the last part of my life. But you know, for, the, for young people, it's very difficult in this period of the, of the year, in this period of the time. And so it's, this is the, it's the future. And you know, we had last year, because I do a congress, which is called CARES. It's the ethical chef days. It's all about young people. And one of the main, speaker last year was Yvonne Chouinard, which is the owner and the founder of Patagonia. And he's really into this. And uh, you know, when you go back 10 years, uh, the world, in a natural way, could produce products for 10, for one, no, for 2 billion people. Today, 10 years later, nature, in a natural way, can produce products for one point two billion people. So we really have to think about nature, we really have to think about the future, because it's a special for our kids. So ultimately what we're talking about, and just to check again, does everyone ask any questions? If not, then the gentleman there, if you'd like to go behind that microphone there uh, and introduce yourself, and, uh, and then ask the question. The microphone's just here, keep going, go on. You also got sunglasses on, so you can't see it, that's what it is. So I'd like to introduce yourself and ask a question before I go to the next one. Uh, my name is Mike, and I just wanted to have uh, like your viewpoint on you know so how uh, you began with talking about how we should uh, sort of like look for food that comes after like with nature. So like for example, like a farmer would grow potato for like one twenty days, and after that he has like almost like eight months of absolutely no potato stock. So then he goes for rice, and then he goes for barley. And having talked about how like uh, nature in ten years time would produce two billion people worth of food, would you say that like the trend in the Western society, like especially like, being from the UK, I know that majority of the population is not just turning vegetarian. They are not even going for the flexitarian option. They're just giving up meat altogether. And being in an expo like this, and being like among being amongst uh, meat products and uh, food processing of meat, in such a way where, on one side, you do want to give up that part of your life, but on the other hand, you see progress by sort of like business entrepreneurs who really don't want to give up on the dream of like you know poultry farming. So, what's your view on that? Like, what like because as consumers, like like we will consume what is in front of us, right? But the, but the job of Making it like a yeah, so what's the question? Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> Well, you know, today we uh, on Earth we have 24 billion of chicken, we have nine billion of pigs, we have uh, 1.5 or 2 billion of cows. They're just farmed to be eaten, and uh, we know that uh, the how do you say? Uh, uh, CO2, CO2. Uh, the, the, the CO2, the atmosphere, oxygen. Yes, it's uh, mostly, mostly made uh, by animals. And so this is a big problem. So that's why 
I think we really should start to think in a different way. We should uh, really go. I mean, when I was when I was little, we had meat once per week. We had on Sunday, we were the whole family was eating meat. Maybe then the rest of the week we were eating one day or two days the leftovers from Sunday. So I don't say that you have to go really back this way and to do just this. But uh, you know, if everybody of us starts to think in a different way, and uh, then I mean, I don't have to have bananas every day. I don't have to have strawberries every day. So does it make any sense for me? I love strawberries, but the best the best way is is when we eat them in, in, in the period of the year when they are. And I mean, I don't know where you're from, but uh, we have in every culture, we, the, the system was working, it was really working. So we just have to see what, what is done. So as, as I said before, we didn't invent anything new. It was already, everything was done. And it was, it was really shocking for me, you know, the more, the more, and the deeper we went in, the more we realized it's all done before. It was all done. We are just, forgetting things, and this is the problem. So if we remember things, and if we follow a little bit you know, more nature, and so th this is what, uh, what, what helps. And what I said before, the book is called The Nature Around You. So it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's always good to have an Indian restaurant in, uh, in, uh, in Dubai. It doesn't make any sense if we fly products around the world like crazy. So this is what we really, really should start to think about it, especially for the future, because with the, the whole water, uh, the water system is, is, we have to be very careful about this. So with that, we've got a different world than we had before, because now from lockdown, people are thinking about things differently. What you're showing is a movement, or the beginning of a movement, about sustainability, and about creating an ecosystem around you with farmers and everybody buying into it. First of all, I'm fascinated to hear the story, which is brilliant, thank you. And also, I would love to come to that restaurant if I can find it, and I'll be very hungry when I get there, no doubt. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Fascinating. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mrs. Norbert Nidakovka. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think the, the, the most important thing is that we really really realized young people are hungry for culture. And with this, this way you can maintain the culture, you can keep the culture, especially from a country, because otherwise we're losing, we're losing our own culture, and everything is equal in the world. So we have just one world culture, and it doesn't make any sense. But you know, it's, we have beautiful, just when you see Italy, Italy is so different from north to south, it's 1,200 kilometers, it's not more. But it's so different, we have different ways of, uh, of uh, products, we have different ways of using the products, it's a different culture-wise, and so that's why this way you can maintain the culture, which is very good for our, for our kids, for the next generations. Thank you very much. I love it. Thank you so much. For that. Great. Now everything's going to go into this sustainable box as it goes around. If I take that one, it's a little bit sustainable, but the rest of it is fantastic. Brilliant. Chef Lavel, we have a lot to talk about because we have an incredible uh, book, an incredible ecosystem. Everything's happening in Dubai and the region, and I'd love to find out exactly what that truly means. So we're going to invite now the other chefs at the back of the room. I know some of them will be coming up and talking and sharing their ideas and their stories. But first, I'd like to put your hands together uh, as we invite on for the launch of Gulf Foods Chef Club, um, Flavel Montero. How are you? We do the elbowing thing if you want. There you go, fantastic. If I jump down because I've got short legs, I can't get back up again, so please forgive me for, uh, for just staying put. Now, this book is something special. I love the cover of it, which has got uh, the Burj. I'll just hold it up so you can see. It's got a Burj Khalifa all lit up. That looks fantastic. Now, this is the best of Dubai, which is a dining experience. I would like to hazard a guess as to what that means, but I'd prefer for you to explain. Now that's your microphone there, just flip it on to make sure it's on. Okay. Yeah, it's on. Perfect. So, what is this book and uh, why is it important? Uh, this book was made in 2020 actually. 
uh, I was running around the world doing books with everyone else and then I decided why don't do a book about Dubai. Uh, got the support of uh, Her Excellency uh, Lahela Suel, who's the CEO of uh, Dubai Tourism. And then it was easy to actually put some of the best boys actually, which people usually run around the world. We actually had them in Dubai. We have over 200 plus nationalities, a collective of cuisine, and here we go running around the world. So, I can actually talk about all the boys who are over here, starting from Kurosh, Pradeep, uh, Nick and Scott, uh, Luigi, Mark Mamosa, nobody's heard of him actually, he's, he's got a restaurant in, uh, in, in Meridian at the airport. Uh, Theo from uh, Food Fund, Taverna, Himanshu has been on the 50 Best Discovery, Francesco Poracino, the first uh, Emirati chef, uh, Musahab Akabi, uh, Matthias, who's a Dutch, and he does some great uh, Mediterranean cuisine. I mean, and the list goes on. Unfortunately, I could only get 34 of them. I was going to say, there's two things. First of all, um, Dubai is, because we live in Dubai, and the rest of the world goes, wow, Dubai, when you live here, it becomes normal to have the very best of the world being here. That's right. And the other thing I was going to say is, when you mention all the chefs, because chefs are cool, they all kind of stared, but we can't tell with the mask on whether it was you, they was talking to or not. So, if you were, I don't know, for the people in the room, if you could mention who they are again, and if you stick your hand up so we can recognize at least your eyes when we come to your restaurant. So, who have we got in the book? Uh, starting with Gurosh, who's standing first. Gurosh, please come up front. You can actually take off your mask there because there's nobody in front of you. And if you want to say something, please. Yeah. Go ahead. You gotta make it very quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, Okay. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Urush Mikashirovic, I'm from Serbia, uh, and I'm working in 21 Brands, uh, urban Balkan cuisine restaurant. We're trying to elevate the very old cuisine, which is pretty much based on, uh, let's say, somewhere we're here now, scarcity, and uh, adapting our cuisine to the ingredients we have on the spot. So, we're all about soul food, we're all about the genuine, real food, and we're trying to push that on another level with uh, with a uh, little bit help of flour and all the way as much. Thank you. Nick and Scott. Come on guys, Nick, Scott, both of you guys, come on. It's like the Oscars for Dubai chefs now, isn't it? <laughs> this is the best actually. Excellent, good to see you again. Uh, hello everybody, uh, I'm Nick, this is Scott, we run Folly by Nick and Scott in Sukhman and Atjamira. Uh, we're in our fifth year now. Uh, I think the main focus of what we've done and what we set out to do was do things a little bit differently uh, and cook food, cook dishes, serve a menu of uh, things that you just won't get anywhere else in town. So I think we've achieved that over the last few years, but um, it'd be lovely to have you all over at some point because I think there's many of you that haven't been over the amount of time that we've been open, so uh, let us know when you want to come over and we'll be happy to cook for you. Anything else? I think from Nick, and, from Nick himself, you know, we've been here 11 years now in Dubai and it's really great to see all the local chefs come together and taking it seriously. Um, and the, the amount of local talent is actually the same. And to have a book like this, it can only be positive in the future. I think there's always been such talent here and finally the city is starting to invest in it. And, you know, back in and then do it how it should be like it is in other worlds and uh, other cities and I think we in the future is really bright. Uh, thank you. Thank you. If, if you can hold on to that microphone, yeah. the COVID uh, reasons we'll use this for all the chefs and talk into. Uh, that way we're not passing it over. Luigi Vesparo, who's from Bull and Bear, uh, Walter Fasoria, DIFC. Hello. Hi guys, uh, always great to be in such a good company like, uh, like today, like yours. Um, as you know, I'd, uh, I'm just based down the road really, in uh, Ulemberg and uh, of Astoria at the DFC. Ulemberg is a uh, contemporary grill, uh, bringing uh, you know, a piece of, uh, of what the Pulp of Astoria in New York was here to uh, 
the center of Dubai. I'm honored to be part of uh, such a great creation and uh, again, great to be in such a great company. Thank you. The two of them, I'll bring them together, is uh, Himanshu and uh, Vino. One from Carnival and one from Preston Studio. Fantastic. Hello everyone. Uh, I just want to congratulate Flavor on the start of it. It's because it's uh, not possible. I've been living in Dubai for the last seven years and in the last one year I've made so many chefs friends. I used to know them, but I've never met them, never spoken to them, and it was uh, been made possible by Flavel and his 50 bear and his uh, best of the way dining experience. So, um, cheers to cheers to that, and I think it's a great initiative because uh, uh, Dubai has been perceived in a in a very wrong way, where the culinary part of it is not portrayed the way it should have been, and I think it's just give us the right opportunity to be collectively promote what Dubai is all about. And uh, that's what I, I believe in, and I congratulate uh, Gulf Food uh, and Flavel and, and to everyone. Thank you. So, I just say thanks to everyone. Uh, Flavel, thank you for uh, having us all together. This is not the first time we are together. Uh, it's keep happening for the last one, uh, one year. Uh, last year was a crazy year. Uh, we, we went through a lot, lot of tough time, but uh, it was one of the best times as well. Because uh, last one year we met together so many times and we started to uh, you know, uh, be together. And uh, I thank you for that. Uh, you keep giving us this opportunity to come together. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I have uh, Musaha? Buzz, we can make it quick and then we got another show coming up after this. Excellent. For people who just joined us in the room, we've only got another 50 chefs to go, so it's going to be fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. Chef Musaba, I'm Ferris Emanachi Chef. I've been 20 years working with the industry. I'm the executive of the Olympic Chef of the Group. I'm happy to be with you guys in the same room. And uh, I think it's not about the cook. I mean, everyone can cook, but it's, it's a culture. That's why we are here more than 200 nationality, nationality living in Dubai. And it's very good to have all of you in one book. As you know, we are more than, I think we are 17 nationalities so far in this book. So, congratulations for everybody. And thanks again to inviting me to this book. Pradeep uh, Kunda. Just before General speaks, yeah. so this book is going to be done annually? It is, it, yes. Uh, the next book is going to be out uh, late March, uh, in a month's time. We've got 65 plus people on it, uh, 65 plus restaurants on it, and the chefs which come along with it. Uh, my aim in 2020 was to actually make Dubai the dining destination of the world. And we actually on track to actually do that. So the next book is going to be called The Best of Dubai, The Dining Destination. Wow. And we're actually going through it, and we're going to have it in reports, uh, which will be at the end of October. Uh, and we, unlike the other awards, which is around the place, this is going to be, I think, for once in my life, I would say, I believe in good news or fake news, or whatever the news was, but this is going to be a transparent award with integrity. Now, two things I want to say. First of all, that book's going to be even heavier if you double the amount of feet as big enough as it is. This book actually weighs 2.2 2 .2 kilos. Wow, there you go. It's a good exercise we've lifted up. The other thing I was going to say is if you're going to do awards, are they voted by chefs for chefs? Are they voted by restaurants, by, by the public? How do you do this? Because this is a big award. If somebody wins with this one amongst all the chefs, it's got to be done right. Uh, this is basically going to be done as a ranking system. Exactly how, I mean, two of them in the world actually do it. One of them is uh, 50 best and the other is La Liste. It actually goes on to how the restaurant is. It's not, it's not the chef. We're not looking at the chef. We're actually looking at what's in a restaurant, uh, i.e. Uh, the ambience. Uh, it even goes down to the restaurants. The restaurants are clean. Uh, the food, yes, the food, the creativeness of the chef. 
Uh, and in general, I mean, to the end, what's the thank you? Is that value for money? Is that, uh, is that a restaurant which I really need to go back again? So with me actually doing this book, uh, I actually put my name onto this, which means that I actually guarantee all these boys in the book are the chefs to go down to eat with them. If you say so, we believe you. That's it. Right. Hi everyone, just two words. Grateful and thankful to be part of this ever evolving evolution of the city. It's been five years now and I've only learned a lot. Made awesome friends and great company. But today we are here to congratulate Flav and actually all of us that we made it to the book and it's a time to celebrate now. Thank you, Flav. Thank you, everyone. Lucian. Uh, Lucian is from uh, a restaurant called Tasca, uh, a restaurant by Jose Avilés from Portugal. Hello everyone. So it's actually it's been a pleasure to be part of this amazing project. So I'm, I'm very good in old stories. I'm very lucky. I've come to Dubai two years and a half. So when I not only from, from Fabio about the project. I will be really, 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 really happy because so this is an amazing thing and especially if I have a lot of different chefs and share ideas and concepts and the position all on every restaurant in the right place and they recognize that. This is well done Fabio. This is a really good job. Um, I think so, that's it. I want to congratulate all the chefs. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to be part of that. And uh, also for the other guys, also. It's a big thank you. Prabha and Pio, I bring both of them. They, they, they come from the same group but different restaurants. It's easier, faster, quicker. <laughs> The meat company, Eat Greek, Taverna, uh, Clay, so various restaurants, so about 21 restaurants in Dubai. So I look after them, they've been there 15 years. Uh, it's always a pleasure to follow uh, anything Global Glasses. So thanks to Global, thanks to Gulf for organizing this. Yeah. Hello there. I'm Theo, I'm from Greece. It's this. Global, thank you so much for the great I really, really appreciate it. Uh, 2013 I came here. Uh, it was only one Greek restaurant. Just, just I want to catch up a little bit about the Greek food and how much popular it became. 2013 I came here, it was only one uh, Greek restaurant. Uh, right now we are more than 20 Greek restaurants, great Greek restaurants. So. I'm super, super happy. I'm part of all this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Flavio. Thank you, dear. Uh, Mark Memos is from a restaurant called Baby Memos in uh, the Meridian Airport. For anybody in the audience, by the way, every chef that's come to speak has offered you a free meal when you go and remember their name. Are they just the same? Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to win the book that uh, I just have two years here in Dubai uh, and our restaurant also has two years of life as well. Uh, it was a pleasure that they were for us. Uh, we make uh, Spanish uh, traditional cuisine uh, based in the traditional flavors and traditional recipes. Uh, it's a pleasure to share also with all the chefs that are in the book. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone. Uh, Diego. From Amazonica. Diego. Oh. I'd like to actually invite a very, very dear friend. I've known him for quite a while, a great chef, Francesco Guaracima from Roberto's. <clears throat> Hello, Flavre, and uh, again, thank you. It's been uh, it's extremely 
exciting every single time that you come up and say uh, we have something for you guys and the uh, difference uh, then we personally so over the time that we get closer and closer it seems that you are doing things that uh, other were not able I hope that we all gonna be able to follow your vision stay together because that way we can change things in Dubai Dubai can be taken much more seriously from the rest of the world because there are a lot of chefs now that have been here for a long time. I was an Italian chef, now I consider myself more a Dubai one, yeah? than not only an Italian, because my cooking experience, my experience has been here for the past 11 years. A lot of what I'm doing is related to Dubai. And I believe that would make lots of difference in the future, also for the other generation, which will start to build a tradition of Dubai food and good experience of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a great chef, a young boy, uh, his name is Don Santa Barbara. He's from Alici. I actually call all these guys my boys. I was going to say, when you say young boy, I was expecting all the young boys. It's well. It's not exactly that. Well, there's the money of service. Thanks to everyone, I believe uh, what Flavel is trying to do is to raise the community in Dubai on another level. Uh, we can achieve that for sure. And if we, as we well, say, we stay together, we work very hard, we can take uh, another level. That's it. Thank you. Matthias. Matthias is, is Dutch. Uh, he runs the restaurant Boca in the IFC. That's what I mean by, uh... Uh, so yeah, so I came to Dubai like about seven years ago when I was uh, 21, and back then I was uh, like looking up to a lot of like great chefs in, into the, in this country, and now like I'm very much honored to be among all the chefs, you know, in like one fantastic book made by you, and uh, yeah, I feel very much elevated to be like with you guys, and uh, let us make it just a great year, you know, like we've tried to like do a lot of sustainable things in Boca, you know, like locally sourcing, uh, like be very responsible, like we're sourcing the products, be seasonal, uh, let, like less imported items, uh, just like all the fresh produce, support the local community and business. Uh, so yeah, that's what we stand for and try to bring it to the next level this year and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, in fact, this book is, 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 is very different. Uh, it's just not about the chefs in the restaurants. I decided, if you don't have Emirati cuisine, the book is not, is not complete. Because we all think Emirati cuisine is, uh, you know, almost not about the day, but it is not. So I actually reached out to a dear, dear friend of mine, she's like my own sister, her name is Jean, and I'd like to actually ask Jean to come up and actually speak, say a few words. Uh, she had a feast at, at Zabil Palace, when, when actually she was with the Highness Sheikh Latifa al makhum and she actually knew what Emirati cuisine was after that afternoon. Please, Jean, it's all yours. Hi everyone, I'm Jean Winter, um, probably the only female Singaporean chef. Um, but I do cooking as a passion, not as my main job. I'm actually a food consultant for governments worldwide uh, and I own a consultancy because um, I was an ex-government scholar and I pretty much deal with advising government bodies around the world on food, cuisine and um, when Trouble had approached me to talk about Emirati cuisine, I realized I had no clue about what it was and because one of my best friends is actually Sheikha Latifa she was the first person I called. I said, Nativa, I need help. I need to understand about the Emirati cuisine. So within the next day, her mother, Sheikha Hassa, had organized a full-blown um, meal for us to pretty much experience what Emirati food was. And that was when I told Flavel, you know, this is when I think it's really, really important for us, not just as chefs, not everyone, every personality in the MFP industry to understand uh, the cuisine of our host country. A lot of us cook our own cuisine, but I don't think we actually understand 
the local cuisine more than we should. And I think moving forward, I've told the um, Flavo that we should be exploring and understanding the cuisine of our host country more. And that is actually the goal that I'm trying to achieve in the next few years. That's it. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's, it's not just a book. It's, it's basically bringing all these chefs together. That was the main, that was the main thing to do, actually. Uh, if you want, if you want Dubai to be the dining capital of the world, you need to get all of them together. It's not the ones and the twos don't make up Dubai dining. So it was to bring these boys together, and by bringing them together it was making them do things together. So that was the first initiative. And the person who actually you know, gave me that boost and said, "Don't worry, I can, you can do it," is a gentleman who's sitting down over there, Ms. Nahim Madad. It's actually put everything together for me. Uh, I mean, I always say, if anything happens to me tomorrow, it's all his. Please, thank you. Please say a few words, please. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll be short and sweet. Industry is our responsibility. Whether it's cooking, service, ambience, experience, anything that we do, we need to make sure that we deliver from the heart, we deliver from the brain as well, it's a combination. Um, I think what's been done in the last 12 months with the help of Flavel and every other uh, entity that's been supporting this cause is, is amazing. I think unity is very, very strong. We need to continue moving forward as a, as a strong, united front representing the industry and there's no going back. It's all ahead, forging ahead, quality, consistency, and we should be proud. We have an amazing brand to fly the flag for brand of Dubai that is, so we should be extremely proud. Thank you for the event for organizing this. Thank you. There's one more gentleman I need to call because uh, he's actually supported me not just as of yesterday, today, a year ago, or a year before. Uh, he's a gentleman from Ireland. Uh, he's the manager and director of a company called Jonestone Beef one of the greatest beef you could ever eat, basically. And, Alan, Boris, please. And tomorrow evening, he'll be, tomorrow afternoon, he'll be doing a butcher, a butchery class in Taste of the World. So, Thank you, Alan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you my best. So, um, thanks for joining me for that. Um, thanks for all the chefs. Um, Definitely a person like me, not so much for this one, you guys. Uh, I can tell you from a, a European point of view and a global point of view, uh, we're all quite lucky in Dubai that we still have restaurants that we can open and we can see our guests. It's not so uh, easy in other parts of the world. Uh, but the good thing about Dubai is that it's always a leader, and certainly in my experience of being in Dubai, working with chefs, chefs make me better, uh, and in making me better, we cook better, we make sure our customers come back time and time again. So uh, I'm delighted to be involved and uh, look forward to working with you all over the next 10 years again. So thanks for that. Thank you. They always say, you got to the best for the last. And the best for the last is a, it's a very dear friend. Uh, I've sat in this restaurant around 6 o'clock in the morning getting drunk. Nobody has ever said anything to me. And his name is Colin Clay, a guy from the Isle of Man. He started Kabara, he was with Zuma, he was with jo uh, Jean George, uh, he was with Jason Arpin in, in Singapore, and then he came back again to Dubai and he opened a great restaurant called Rubia, even in London. Come on, please. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's, I suppose I am the oldest here, so. Uh, no, 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 me. Yeah, a few months. Yeah, so I first came in 1999, uh, although not since, but. Uh, What's happened over the last year has been a nightmare for most people. Um, but it's nice that something like this has brought us all together and makes us uh, stronger together. So it's been a good ride there. Uh, give me something to do. And, uh, all right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We, we have a saying where I come from. Uh, if you go for something, you don't go empty handed. So I'd like to give this book which will be signed for you. Oh goodness, thank you. You're welcome. Is it edible? It is edible, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
That's the guy doing 30 so much the sun as well as brilliant. Well, Flav, it's been brilliant having you on stage and the incredible chefs responsible for building up the profile of Dubai to make us one of the most sought out destinations and one of the best dining places on the planet. Not just one of the best, the aim is to make it the best. And if anybody can drive that, it's going to be you. Thank you very much. No, it's these boys, please. Fantastic. I'm only, I'm only going to be the tool to actually drive the form. That's it. Well, it's down to you with the book and certainly for a relationship you create. I, I, and the only leverage I have with these guys is the book. Because if they say no, they, they, they're off the book. Oh. <laughs> it, it's, a world, it's, it's a world of business these days, correct, man? That's true, but that's my book now, so you can't have <laughs> that. So, gentlemen, thank you, Flavel. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for coming in and sharing your ideas, sharing your, your thoughts about the future of Dubai, and of course, keep making that incredible contribution because we all thank you for it. Because every single business does better when you do what you do. So, once again, for everybody in the room, all responsible for being the best in Dubai, thank you so much for your time. Brilliant. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your patience. I realize that you're watching me running about thinking, what's he doing? And I just, here's the thing. Since we went into lockdown a year ago, I've completely lost sense of any day or any time. It could be Christmas tomorrow, and it would feel exactly like yesterday or the day before. I don't know if that feels the same for you. I oh, know it's just me. Okay, well, anyway, that's how it is kind of thing. So with that, it's really strange to have to think about time, but here we are doing it properly. So if you in earlier, you saw some incredible guests that were talking to us about their, their different views of how the culinary world could be improved, could be changed, could be reinvented, some in a post-COVID world, some restoring the best of what we had before, and others looking towards where we're going to be in the future. Our next guest is going to be sharing with us not only how we can all be a lot fitter, we should eat a lot better, but also how we can reinvent the relationship we have our, with our very own bodies. And uh, as you can see from my own personal experience, I really want to know a lot about that. So please put your hands together and invite our first guest up, Mr. Marcus Smith. Round applause! There you go. How are you? We do the fisty thing, I think. There you go. Excellent microphones there. Now, needless to say, that picture does you justice. You, you are the Terminator. Um, now, here's the thing. Quite clearly, your relationship with food is different to the relationship that many other people have, if not almost everybody in this entire building. Because Why do you say that, Dave? The reason I say that is not because you look fitter, but that's true as well, is because every single person I've, said, I've seen is going, look young. <laughs> and I know that what you do must be really healthy, but the, it's, it's a, the challenge I think for many people is you know you can feel guilty if you eat healthy, but at the same time you want to feel wicked by having what you like. And that is a thing yes. that I want to be able to look at. Is yeah. that true? <laughs> That's an interesting one. I've never heard it put that way before. But I think maybe the, the, the bottom line motivation in the last year, maybe ask the audience as well, is like, do you want to feel good? because you can and, and a lot of that like we go to the gym and we we partake in, in, in a number of different fitness and health rituals to feel better but a lot of time are we addressing that through food and you can get that through food just by eating well you can actually feel really good and what I'm saying here is things like waking up in the morning not feeling energized for the day. We're just after lunch now. Who's ready to fall asleep? Not from my talking, but just generally, we're getting a slump, or at four o'clock, we need another coffee, and we're, we're rolling with all these different stimulants the whole time. Whereas, if we dial it back to quite straightforward food and pay attention to the food that we're putting into our bodies, we can increase our performance in every area of life by a really decent percentage. Well. As you mentioned that, there's not a single person I think in this room is not going, yeah, 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 but I feel guilty looking. Here's the thing, when we've had this, I mean, that would be in a normal world. In this post, well, not even post-COVID world, in this COVID world, yeah. where it's still pandemic, still lockdown in many countries, and to a little degree we've got that um, in the surrounding area. Um, 
you've got comfort food to keep your head in the right space, yeah. and it's harder to balance up what you should be doing for your body when you're not going out to play and nobody's going to look at it. <laughs> That's very true, mate. And if you're, that, that also, this is a really good question again, who's good at this, that also is, is a lot about are you motivated by what you see when you wake up in the mirror or are you motivated by everyone looking at you in, in an audience like this? Let's park that one for a little bit. You've struck on a really interesting note there that during COVID, a lot of people in lockdown put on a lot of weight. Why? Because... They don't go out to play. They don't go out to play and also they have a lot of what you just alluded to there. Comfort food. Comfort food. Thank you very much. In the house the whole time. And it does like, I love chocolate. <laughs> and Not as much as I do. I love ice cream. Like, I'm not gonna sit up here and lie. It's great, it gives us immediate gratification. And when times are tough, we're looking for immediate gratification, which then loops back to our motivation as well. So it is a challenging time, mate, but there are foods out there that will give you a similar gratification if you change your mindset around it. Now, I'm not telling you, you used to do hypnosis. I still do hypnosis. Still does hypnosis. Now, I'm not gonna ask Dave to hypnotize me and make me eat broccoli and tell you all it's chocolate because I don't think that's fair. No. So, we can't trick the brain that much, but when we look at the ingredients of things like, let's take chocolate, a lot of chocolate, I don't know one in here is from a chocolate company and wants to beat me up around the back no, afterwards. No, no, no. Well, I don't think we're going to be able to, but carry on. <laughs> but if you take something like chocolate and the ingredients in it, and look at which ingredients are more natural and then what's added to it, and the biggest one we know is sugar. Where can we get more natural sugar from, and can we make that chocolate bar in a more natural way? And we're seeing a lot of these types of brands come to the market now, and the two ingredients that I'm talking about are dates and cacao. And we can get those very naturally, and companies are putting them into a chocolate bar. So the, the thought, yes, I'm eating this chocolate bar, it's my little guilty pleasure. I'm getting elevated sugar levels in my body, but just in a lot more natural way. So sometimes it's harder to get hold of that product, but the effect, the impact on our body is actually very similar. But of course, it's a lot easier to hop on a, any delivery app and you can have ice cream, not in Dubai summer, but you can have ice cream on your front door in 10 minutes. So, I mean, you mentioned there the, the, the special type of chocolate. What brands are you talking about? Because I'm fascinated by knowing who I can call to not feel so guilty about <laughs> eating so much chocolate. There's quite a lot of raw brands coming to the market now. We've, we're actually seeing them in, in petrol stations. The food company that I sat with my wife's, Mystery Paleo, we don't actually do chocolate, but we do more natural, healthy, sweets, brownies, muffins that are, are made instead of from sugar, are made more from date paste and, and honey. And people will have seen them. The, the, the section, if you take a, a grocery store like Carrefour, the, I think it's called the healthy kitchen section, is actually growing massively now. And not everything in there, <laughs> slam calf, no, not everything in there is always super healthy. You still need to be checking the ingredients, but the market's growing and we're moving away from some of the traditional chocolate brands like probably you and I grew up on the Camrys, the Round Trees, and these guys, and we've got these options. The problem is for a lot of people, and this is probably where you come to next is, well, maybe I've seen them, but the price is a lot higher. And that is one of the challenges we're, we're facing right now is I think 15 or 20 years ago to get a piece of steak from the butcher, a couple of vegetables would have been a cheaper option, but I can go into my local Tesco's back in the UK now and that's gonna cost me about 15 pounds, whereas a pizza ready to go in the oven cost me 99p. So we're in a little bit of a, we're in a tough scenario, especially you said, mate, the last year's been tough for a lot of people and people are often going a little bit cheaper on their food and sacrificing on ingredients, which I get it, but that's, that's not helping us a great deal. Well, tell us about your own brand and how that came about. Quite clearly, you, you, you and your, your other half were looking at a market and saying something should be done, but that takes a lot of investigation. What was the tipping point to make you want to investigate it deeper? Two things, mate. As I said, I have a sweet tooth, a really sweet tooth, and I love sweets, same as everyone. Main course is finished, I'm straight in the, in the fridge, where's the chocolate? And I was like, there's got to be a way to make healthier sweet treats. 
So in about 2005, I started to Google and try and figure out what's what, and I found paleo eating. And around the same time, my wife was crew with Emirates for, for a long time, and she was suffering inflammation. And I think this was probably the tipping point in that she lay on the couch and her ankles were always super swollen after a flight. And she'd asked me to massage them, and I'm not good at that, mate, it's not really my jam. And luckily, every time I sort of even touched her ankle, this inflammation was so great that I had to stop, so I never actually had to give her a massage. And I dug deeper into reducing inflammation in the body through food and inflammatory foods that we're eating. And we started to address certain areas for her. And one of those was sugar, second one was dairy, and the, the third one was really gluten. So stuff like bread, rice, grains. And as she started to remove them, the inflammation came down to a point where I did have to massage her ankles. And I was like, well, if you're facing this problem, I'm coming at it from a different angle. I've got a sweet tooth that I want to crave. We need to investigate it further. And we did that. And, and Holly actually, over, over her travels, she'd go to beautiful places in the world with Emirates, and she'd be like, I ate such and such. I wonder if I can make that healthy. And I ate this, and I wonder if I can make that healthy. And she, she'd rattle off the ingredients, and I'd be like, how are you even going to do that? And honestly, a lot of it's just through research in, in, in the internet and Google to a point in 2016, she had basically about 40 or 50 different main dishes that she made up, loads of different sweet treats, and we launched Mystery Paleo. And we've been serving a, it's quite a niche community for, for the last four or five years. And, you know, she, she since left Emirates, doesn't have any problems with inflammation. We've been in a fortunate position where we've been able to take people through a paleo journey and cure a number of issues, whether it's tiredness, brain fog, there's loads of different things going on when we have inflammation on in the brain. And that's really how it started out. And that's more, my passion really on, on human performance today is to kind of figure out why certain things are happening in the body and what we can do without going to a hospital. Because the first port of call for a lot of people, I feel sick or I've got a headache, let's take Panadol, except in COVID where no one knew what to take, but still. And we, we want this, again, going back to what we said earlier, this immediate gratification. You know, I want to lose my belly. Oh, there's some diet pills. Do you want these? Like, really? Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, those pills are going to take away all of those cheeseburgers that you ate at three in the morning or however you ate them. So. It takes time and it, it is a journey and those people that have been through sort of removing certain food groups or checking in intolerances will also know this as well. It, it can be quite unrewarding at times because there it takes time to figure out what things work and don't work for your body. But when you get it right, it's like you found this great recipe to literally, you know, if you, it's like when you, a business goes really well, it's like, wow, we've nailed it. Or when an athlete, an Olympic athlete, Usain Bolt runs his perfect race and gets a world record, everything just goes right. And I think every single person in this room, in every room, should wake up every morning and feel really good and energized and be able to sit here and answer one of your questions for like five minutes without you interrupting. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here to help. Um, but do you think, from your experience, that the lockdown and the reset that's happened across industries has also meant that people are now, we've been here for a year, now more open to reset the way they, they eat? Are you getting more feedback like that way? Or do you go the opposite direction? So, when lockdown happened, because my other business is a gym, I thought everyone would just work out. I was like, <laughs> I don't know why, maybe, but it's just like, you know, I, I thought everyone would just start working out in their living room. And it turns out that a lot of people did, and it turns out that a lot of people didn't. And they used... Why do you look at me like that? Was it didn't? <laughs> Do -do. <pointing> at me. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's both ways. I definitely think that there is a lot more awareness around health, and not only physical health and well-being, but our mental health and well-being of which your food is a, is a massive component than there has ever been before. We also have to look at this day on, without rattling off all the stats of the two point whatever million people that passed away from COVID, how many of them had pre-existing conditions 
and how many of those conditions are related to the food, related to the food that they ate. That's pretty serious. And you look at it, it's super high. But, well, you say this and I'm listening to it, but I've never heard of people connecting those two things together. I've heard about pre, you know, pre conditions, a lot of pre existing conditions, but not because of their diet, unless it's taken as a whole, but they just didn't look after themselves very well. What, what, and then I'd ask you so, what causes them to be in the condition that they're in? And if you look at most people that are sick right now, a lot of the, the reason contributing factors is their food. Okay, so with that, let's take the the diagnosis that you would say, let's take an average person who might look a bit like me, long dreads, possibly in his, in his late 30s, shut up. Um, where would you start and what would you recommend? The simplicity of it is, mate, is you can do one thing. If everyone can leave this room today doing one thing, you drink the sugar in there. No, stop it, you're not my mum. It's just coffee. I think it lies. Is there any sugar in it though? Because this is a really no, easy place to I stopped, start. I stopped sugar in everything, but then again during lockdown, I had a big tub of m and right next to my laptop. You're so like the best person to be having this discussion with, mate. It's awesome. If you can do one thing today, reduce the amount of sugar you take in. That would help you incredibly. Different research would suggest that you need one teaspoon of sugar a day to stay alive. It doesn't have to be the white stuff that's on the table. It can be from dates and honey more naturally. Have a think about the cup that Dave's drinking out of. And this is a little bit of a generalization. Thankfully, mate, you don't fall into it, but I'm pretty sure there's milk in there, which I believe is for babies. Anyway, we'll move on to dairy in a minute. It's not real dairy. It can't be real dairy. It's not some sort of- So it's made in a factory. So Dave's currently, sorry mate, but this is brilliant. Dave is currently drinking coffee, which is natural, along with something that was made in a factory. He's putting it in this incredible body that he's got, all jokes aside, it it's an good. incredible machine, but he's putting something that was manufactured in a factory to taste like something that comes out of a cow into his body. Does this sound like a good idea? Did anyone laugh? When Trump said, let's inject bleach, let's not make it about Trump, but everyone laughed. So we're putting things into our body which are completely unnatural. If you can stop those things, and let's go back to the coffee example, you need one teaspoon a day. A lot of people, I did a study on, on people that came to see me, they would drink three to four cups of coffee a day, and each cup of coffee would have one and a half to two spoonfuls of sugar. Two by four is eight, and you need one. And that's just from what his coffee. If he had a soda, if he had a sauce that we think is fat-free because it says fat-free on it, but it's loaded with sugar, he would have a lot more overload of sugar. So if you were saying that you were, mate, we've gone around the houses. I'm so glad I invited you up on stage. <laughs> if you're asking what can we do right now, we can stop sugar and we can stop things that are made unnaturally and we can go back to eating things that are completely natural. If it goes off within four or five days, it's probably okay for you. If it doesn't, it's got preservatives, additives, chemicals, and all sorts in it. So for instance, I stopped having proper milk. The only reason I'm having that is because we're here, and I'm going down the route of almond milk or oat milk. Is that bad news, or is that okay? Nut milk, almond milk, and oat milk, actually a lot better. Yeah, they're super good. The problem you've got, and I don't know if you check it, but if you look at in the store where the almond milks are, there'll probably be four different almond milks available, of which three of them will have sugar added to them. There'll be one that doesn't have sugar added to them. And if we did a taste test, the one that's got sugar added, most people would like the most. So we take a good product, we extract the milk from the almond, it's nut milk, it's slightly higher in fat, which is beneficial if you don't have too much, but then we add sugar to it. And these are the things that, it's a minefield out there, because I, I remember I was in Marks and Spencer in the UK about 18 months ago, and there was some, just a chicken breast, and it said basically, plain, pure chicken breast. And I thought to myself, is it really? And I turned it around, and there was added sugar and salt. 
How many people, when they go into a store and they buy something, do they actually look at the back? And I've got a really easy way to read these labels. If you can't pronounce what it says, it's probably not very good for you. <laughs> right or wrong, it's really straightforward. M and M, I can manage that. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, things like nut milks, there are, it's the same as where we sort of started. There are good alternatives for, for chocolate. Yes, we can use dates and honey, maple syrup instead of normal sugar that we see. Nut milks are, are, are great for coffees as well, but the more fabricated stuff is not what we want to do. I agree with you completely, and uh, I will take more notice of it because you're staring at me as I do it. <laughs> um, so when you're at an event, uh, and I mean, we all do many events nowadays, unfortunately, like that, but when you're at an event or you connect with people and so on, how long does it normally take for a person to change their their diet, their food, and start seeing immediate results? That's a really good question, and I'll try to give a straight answer if I can, but it is different for everyone, mate. What will generally happen, let's take sugar. It's one of the most addictive drugs there is. If you're trying to come off sugar, and I'm sure there's some people in this room, maybe you, Dave, as well, have tried to give up sugar, it's like giving up any substance you'll have a massive crash because for want of a better word it's almost like if you put super duper petrol in your car you know, every time they go to the gas station want super sir what does it actually do for my car now oh you should put one in five in and your car doesn't go any faster but if you're putting really good petrol in your car like supercharged petrol in your car and then you stop putting it in that's what we're doing at the moment with sugar we're supercharging our system and then we're not putting we're not supercharging it for a while. So there's this withdrawal. People that have given up, as I said, maybe even things like cigarettes, they might be resonating with exactly what I'm saying. That can take anywhere up to seven days. Some people are good. Some people are good with me going, Dave, not two spoons of sugar, just one, mate. And we'll work on that for this month, and then next month, we'll, you know what I mean? And we, for a lot of people though, within, if you sort of go a little bit cold turkey, as we'd say, Within about 14 days, those cravings should have gone and you should feel your energy creep up again. You've been fueling your body with sugar for a number of, not you know, for a number of years. To get it to change, spin around like that, is very tough. It can take a little bit of time. And that's where it's almost like people that would stop going to a gym after the first day because they don't have a six pack and think that that's okay. Like, it takes a little bit of time to get in shape or to do that pull up or, or whatever, or to run a marathon. So we need to be ready to train a little bit. But there's no reason why after a couple of weeks, if you're replacing the food that you're taking out, which is super important, a lot of people just remove stuff and go into this insane calorie deficit, which for a short period of time works, and expect that their body is gonna work You've been stuffing in two and a half, three thousand calories for a number of years of all sorts of junk, and then you suddenly take that out, you're gonna get a reaction from your body. So it takes a little bit of time, and that's where, you know, you might not lose weight immediately, and you might not feel better immediately, but after two to three weeks, mate, you should definitely be feeling a lot better. Thank you. And when you say mate, you don't mean me, you mean, you know, hypothetically mates when you're talking about All my mates. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We've got time for one question from the audience. Would anybody like to ask a question all about uh, what Mark's going to talk about in terms of the fitness, in terms of the diet? Please, would you like to stand up at that uh, microphone there? Say who you are, where you're from, and please feel free to ask a question. Hi, uh, my name is Martin. I'm from Poland. I do long distance triathlons. I have a feeling about the sugar reduction during the long distance races. You probably know the feeling when you are in your sixth or eighth hour of the race and you're very tired of the sweetness after 50 gel that you consume. Uh, how do you feel on uh, long distance races to avoid uh, the straight sugars and to avoid the sickiness in yeah. your stomach? That's a really good question. And I also do long distance ultra endurance events and I've tried both. I've used synthetic gels because they've been proven in, in, in races to help a lot of people. And I've had exactly what you said. I've had problems in races where it's not pretty. Let's, let's keep it like that. And now I just take dates with me. I ran a marathon three weeks ago 
in just over three hours, I ate two dates. So I just try to keep it as natural as I can. And is that optimal? And I had a lot of discussion with, with group of coaches that work for me. Could we have run faster than that if we'd have had like that constant endurance mindset of fueling with gels? Maybe, but also maybe not. It's the best I've felt for a long time in America. So I still try and keep it really, really natural during those races. Great question. With that, um, for people who want to connect with you and get the rundown of what they should be doing, how do we find you? Easiest thing is on Instagram, MJD underscore Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, please, for Marcus Smith. Thanks so much. I do feel guilty and I'm going to enjoy my coffee regardless because I've got a bit after this. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Cheers, man. So next up, we're going to be looking at the industry of pastries, and we're joined by the wonderful uh, Alana Doe. Please put your together. Alana, I'm so glad you just came in, because if you'd been there all the way through the wonderful chat I had with Marcus, uh, Mr. Terminator over there, we're just talking about sugar and about how basically, like, well, look, is what looking sugar. Exactly, you love sugar. And he just, he just made me feel guilty about my coffee, and there's nothing in it. So let's start off by looking at the fact that, I mean, how long have you been in Dubai and where do you work? Let's get that bit established first. So, I've been in the UAE since 2012, been in the eight, nine years. Um, I work for Sabrina Hospitality, which is a restaurant group, restaurant division based, based in Jumeirah. Um, I came over here, I was only 22 years old, so I was quite a baby. Bang on my back, just took the risk and thought, you know what, let's try and get a job managed to secure a job at the Address Hotel as a soup pastry sous chef, and then work my way up from there. Right, before we actually talk about anything else, let's go for the elephant in the room. Pastries and sugars and all the rest of it. Is there a healthy version of it, or should we just drop that conversation and move on? Just, let's just, let's just move away. Right, Marcus, I'm just telling you that. I did check. And now, as much as I agree with you, and he's not looking, let's just carry on. Can so, somebody just remove him? <laughs> <laughs> so when we're talking about the pastry industry, first of all, one of the things that you and I mentioned before is the fact that for many organisations, um, they have, first of all, look at the pastry chefs and the, the work that they do, um, they have opportunities to think differently about the way that they create things and distri distribute them throughout a hotel chain. So the pastry chefs, and I don't, we don't want to ruin their job by any way, shape or form, but they're just an example of sometimes the distribution of work can be different. Can we explain what that means? So it certainly can. When I came over here, I was very young, very fresh, and I spent all my time at a hotel. You go to work, you're in the hotel 12, 15 hours a day, you leave work, and you only know what's around you. When I was 24, I was actually offered the opportunity to start a company, and it was going to be a business to business dessert manufacturing company. And I was like, no, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to make frozen cakes, that's, that's rubbish. I want to be this, you know, hot shot shine and pastry chef. And somebody said to me, look, you've got nothing to lose, go and do it. I said, okay, fine. I went and did it. It's the best thing I've ever done because it made me realise how much opportunity there is in the industry, around you, in your local communities to create revenue, to create and generate other streams of revenue than just making pastries for your lobby lounge or making pastries for your pool bar, etc, etc. So it's a really, really big, big eye-opener. And I think in this country, so many hotels are like, no, we need a head pastry chef and a pastry sous chef and then a chef de party. The pay roll is so heavy and ultimately they're producing maybe a thousand portions of cake a day. Whereas if you look at what's around you, you could be saying to your local bakery or your local shop, hey, do you need some desserts? We can provide for you. But hotels and, and businesses aren't operating on the correct business model to do that. And I basically destroyed Saru Hospitality's business model because they were like, oh, what are you doing? You know, you want to supply outside? No, we only buy inside. So it's about flipping things on its head. Now money speaks volumes. So when a company like a hotel chain starts seeing the profits, then they start to warm towards the idea of doing it, especially right now when everything seems to be going in the opposite direction of cutting back. How hard was it to persuade an organisation that's not set up to be doing outside catering 
of creating a stream of, 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 uh, of revenue from selling outside the premises to actually do it. So I was quite lucky because I had a successful business behind me and I had a reputation in the industry for being able to do it. It didn't take that much persuading for the big bosses because they can see the bigger picture. But the people in finance are, they wanted to kill me. They were like, no, we're not doing this, it's too much work, you know, reconciliation, statement of accounts. You know, they were crying. But now I think people are starting to realize, okay, hang on, this can gain traction. And we have the equipment, we have the resources, we have the staff, we have the trained chefs. So why would you not do it? Why would you restrict yourself only to supplying within your portfolio when you could potentially expand, 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 and grow? Now, I'm going to say something which Marcus isn't going to like, but I'm going to say it anyway. During the lockdown, people, if anything, were looking for food that made them happy. So did you find that the pastry world went through the roof and, and cakes and so on? Yeah, it is. Like, everybody wants something sweet to, to curb their craving that they've got and make them feel happy. We all know that cake is comfort food. Nobody can sit there and tell me that it isn't. Go I mean, look at me, I'm not particularly small. Well, I eat cake every day. Is there anybody here who hates cake apart from Marcus? Can somebody please remove this guy? Right? No, no, no. <laughs> well, thing is, just very quickly, with that, do you ever cheat? There you go. That's there we all. go. No further questions, Your Honour. Yeah, so I, Marcus, actually did a speech for Dubai Holding. Good. It was like one of his motivational speeches, and I got osteoporosis and I've got degenerative spine. So it was actually quite inspiring, you know, other people that are going through issues and are pushing through daily. And I, at the end of the message, I was chatting to him, like, how do you stay motivated and whatever on WhatsApp, on Instagram? And he was like, do you know what? Bring me an armor cross on and we'll have a coffee. It's like, deal. Fantastic. <laughs> so we still haven't had that armor cross on a coffee, but we'll set it up for next week. Well, you know what, years ago when I was working on radio, I remember that I was interviewing a group called Westlife. I don't know the, the, the yeah. top group Westlife. Anyway, I'm interviewing these guys, and their job is to be as clean and squeaky clean as you possibly could. So they're there, and we're at a press conference, and we all sit there saying, it's important we don't drink, we don't smoke, anything like that, because of our, our, our you know, following. And as they're saying it, it was one of the guys, Brian McFadden, turned around and he said, have a look. He took out a pack of cigarettes and just, <laughs> so there's often guilt out there depends on what the people want to actually put out. So when we're looking at the industry, the pastry industry, do you think it's growing as a result of what we have right now? If so, what are the opportunities that people are missing out on that they could be jumping into? Because at the end of the day, we're at Gulf Food, so it is a catering um, event. I do believe that there is a lot of opportunities. I mean, dark kitchens, we've seen the growth in dark kitchens. It's crazy how many people are like, oh, if I just pay you some money, can you just come up and set a kitchen up for me? And I'm like, you guys don't understand that there is you know, a lot behind it, years of experience and training and you know, improving. Um, I think you know, I've seen a lot of home bakers. Like you see people are selling stuff on Facebook, they're selling stuff on Instagram. Again, they've taught themselves or they've been to a class and learned that they want to sell. And I applaud stuff like this. You know, there's nothing wrong with trying, but I do believe that there is a lot of stigma in the industry of like, oh, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing this. Do you know what? If the opportunity's there, go for it. Well, I don't know if everybody understands what a dark kitchen is, but a dark kitchen is when there's no restaurant attached to it, but you're still creating the food. And in many cases during the COVID world, uh, when they had lockdown, the chefs were still creating the food, but it was going out and being delivered through Uber Eats and Telebat and so on. Uh, but that's obviously a growth area in many cases. So what I want to look at now is during the lockdown, certainly in the UK, it might have been in the UAE, but I don't know, the amount of people cooking from home and doing incredible things like the bread, the bread thing, yeah. the sourdough, the banana, the, yeah, banana <laughs> loves, things with toenails, not as popular, <laughs> but all the ideas of making stuff, that must be even more so when you're looking at pastries and cakes and so on. So with that, do you first of all feel that there's a, a, a threat into your, in your job because of it? Or do you think there's an opportunity to, to grow more at home pastry chefs? I don't think there's a threat. I actually think the industry is lacking pastry chefs. Like we really need more people to come into the industry. And that, you know, being a chef, it's not an easy life. We do work long hours. It's, you know, it's per se a man's world, which we're trying to, again, remove the stigma from. It's very much a woman's world, actually, because, you know, women are the ones that are home and that are cooking for their children, their mum cooks for them, their grandma cooks for them. You know, females are, I would say, better chefs. 
you know, it's fantastic. But I, you know, I want people to cook at home. I want people to try. And, you know, if they don't try, people like myself are there. Reach out, ask questions. Hey, I tried this croissant, but it didn't work. Can you help me? Of course I'll help you. You know, I, I don't do things for money. I do things for the passion of what we do. Like, I absolutely love pastry. I eat, sleep, and breathe it. And I want people to have that passion and, and jump on the bandwagon. Do you think, I mean, what we've got in, in this particular city, in this particular region, is because you've got um, a real mixture of lots of different nationalities and their culinary tastes, almost everybody's got a different type of pastry that comes in, the Arabic delights as well as the Western stuff and everything else. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I think everybody has their own culture, but I also love the fact that we can learn from other cultures. Like the other day, we were developing gulab jamun. Now, gulab jamun is a very traditional Indian dessert. You know, ask anybody, they know it. It's cheap, it's sweet, it's like basically cocaine full of sugar, you know, it makes your, your brain buzz. And I don't know how to make gulab jamun. What is it called again? I don't know how to make gulab jamun. I'm, you know, a, a British expat, but my Indian chefs do. So we spent days like learning, training, getting it, you know, the authentic way. And it was a fantastic experience. And then when I tell them, right, we're going to make a spotted dip, they're looking at me like, what is that chef? And I'm like, right, I'm going to teach you. So having this It's task, a dessert, by the way, for dessert, anybody who didn't know where this was going. Okay? Google it. Maybe don't Google it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, having that hub of, of just so many different cultures means that you can have so many different fusions of desserts. You know, I literally would put good afternoon in a baked cheesecake. And people are like, that's insane. And now it's going to be on one of our dessert menus for an Indian Arabic Persian concept. So, I love it. I think being in this part of the world is awesome. Okay, I'm going to give you a hard time now. I'm not doing it because Marcus was in the room, but because of the fact that there's a real challenge for our children who have a very sedentary lifestyle of iPad, phone, and no going out to play. It's so easy just to pop the food in. I mean, I feel the guilt of it from lockdown because I'm on my computer. I tend to live like that. So you tend to be, well, you're delivering more of those tasty delights. How do you sleep at night? Very easily. All right, go. Um, <laughs> so I also um, have developed ranges of cakes that have reduced sugar, that are diabetic friendly, that are egg free, sugar free, dairy free, gluten free, flourless. It's, you know, you can take a cake that you know and that you're comfortable with, and then you can see how you can flip it on, your, on its head. So how can I extract the refined sugar? How can I replace it with natural sugars, with, you know, cane sugar or with agave syrup, something like that. So there's definitely ways to make it better for you. As I say, it's going to kill you, it's just going to take longer to kill you. You know what, the last answer you gave me, I didn't hear anything, all I heard was the word cake. <laughs> and my head went on holiday during that. But it's a real sugary region though, isn't it? It's it is. a really sugary sweet region. Do you know, and there is a push to make people more healthy, and you're guilty. I'm just well, saying. This is one thing that frustrated me massively about this country. So when I came here, everything was how it looked versus how it tasted. So you've got cake that is full of sugar, it's supposed to be raspberry, and you're like, okay, there should be some raspberry in here somewhere. Oh, no, still no raspberry. You've got a really shiny glaze, it looks amazing, but the taste of it is rubbish. So part of my previous company's uh, dessert tagline was desserts redefined. And it was about taking the cakes back to how they should have been made, stripping away the sugars, enhancing the flavors in there, using the natural purees, less sweetener. Sugar has no taste, but it masks taste. So if you remove sugar, you will actually enhance taste without even doing anything. Make sense? No. Just don't use the white sugar and it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it doesn't. Have you ever put a spoon of sugar in your mouth? Just Never. put a spoon of sugar, I'm no. sure you have, what's the line? Yeah, I'm okay, sure you have, yeah. everyone has. What do you taste? Yum. Nothing. No, nothing. There's no taste. So pull the sugar back out and, and actually try and make the cakes taste like what they're supposed to. So with that, I was fascinated to find out more about the healthy options in the pastry world, if that is as possible as you say. How should a parent or somebody who knows they have a, a sweet tooth and a love of pastry and cakes and so on, and their children do, because this is a massive problem with the, the knock-on effects of it, how do they get bored now? Just looking at Larry, how long is it going to keep asking these questions? I want the sugar rush. Um, how do parents start without having a, um, you know, the, the kids refusing to do anything in the house uh, to make it a bit more of a healthy option? So if it was me, I would introduce them to the natural sugars first. So things like mango. Mango is gummy, it's naturally sweet, it's not full of rubbish. 
you give them this to start them off, and you give them things like honey, like a real good honey, not just a coloured refined sugar extract or whatever, and this kind of stuff will make them understand, okay, this is sweet, this tastes nice, I'm enjoying this, and then you can slowly progress them onto other stuff. If I had kids, that's how they would that, That's how you start. Yeah. For, not that I have any idea, but... Well, I know how you make kids, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. Um, I'm going to ask you a question first of all. First, first thing is, if anybody has any questions for Alana, then we have a microphone there. Please feel free to just put your hand up so I know that you're going to ask a question, and then you're very welcome to do that. Um, you got a question? Okay. So if you'd like to go to that microphone there, it has been sanitized. Uh, if you say who you are, where you're from, just going left a bit, left a bit, warm a bit, very good. Uh, say who you are, where you're from, so we can be able to place that, and then uh, feel free to ask a question. Hi, I'm Hannah from Beirut. I have my own uh, catering company called Coco and Co. Um, we've done loads of cakes and cookies and cupcakes, and always, always using sugar as the main thing. But now that the, the company has grown and I have grown, I feel that I need to explore some something a bit more healthy, as we're just as we're just saying. But I, I find you can replace flour easily. You can replace egg, whatever. But the sugar is the most difficult thing to replace. So what do you suggest? I'm, I'm not a fan of honey, and maple syrup is, is very expensive where we are. Yeah. Um, anything sweeteners like stevia and, and the rest, um, I've been hearing, hearing of mom too. Because also my mom is diabetic, so I'd like to help her in that. She loves cake. So, yeah. how can so make cake have you heard sugar? of something called isomalt? Yes. Yeah, so isomalt can actually be a replacement of sugar. It doesn't do the same technicality function that sugar does, but you can flip recipes around to incorporate it and try and use it. And also things like trimaline, which is obviously an extractive enzyme of sugar, and glucose. So neither of them are sweet, but they have the same functionality. So if you're making, uh, for example, when we whisk eggs and sugar together, we call it savion, remove the sugar and use trimaline instead, and it will have exactly the same, same effect. If that makes sense, I hope that answered your question. Just making notes now and checking no out the way to do that. Do we have any more questions related? Please, would you like to just go to the microphone again, introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, and also ask a question. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chef. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm a big fan of you. Uh, I admire all what you're doing because I'm an example. Um, I'm myself a pastry chef of Norris Pastry in Las but French specialities. Um, I admire the, the, the first interact, interaction that you said, you grew up yourself. This is the stage where I am at the moment, been fighting for almost two years to create my image, and now I wanted to extend. And in the Middle East, I am only in two years here, so any advice to extend from a small pastry French kitchen to a, not a, a commercial, but to, uh, supply, to be able to supply hotels and other businesses. Thank you. Nice question. So, what I would suggest, I remember when we first started our first, when we had our, our company, I'll never forget, my first customer was Tony Romans, and he was just an American bakery, and all he wanted was a brownie and a cheesecake. And I was like, oh my God, I've left you know, London, I worked at the Savoy Hotel in London, Claridge's, the Ritz, I've left all of this, and I'm making brownie and cheesecake, you know? You're like, oh, what have I done? But it was about the customer service, it was about the connections, it was about the networking, and it's about having that relationship. I'm a big believer that you don't employ a salesperson, and I know, sorry to anybody that may be in sales, and, you know, I don't want to lose your jobs, but I go to the customers myself because I'm passionate about what I'm making. So for me, I would suggest for you, have a look in your local community, see who needs cake, or go and have, you know, I always just go and eat at people's restaurants, and then I'd eat it and be like, okay, these need help. And then I'd start a conversation, and I'm brass and I'm bold, and I don't care what anyone thinks. I'd walk in and be like, guys, I've eaten this, and I think we can do better. Can I bring you samples? And they were like, you know, who the hell are you? Get out. And you're like, okay, fine, I'll bring samples. Next day you turn up with a box of cake, they eat it, and they're like, wow, this is good. Okay, can I, can I look at supplying you? And you build the relationship, and then people started to talk. And in the end, I was supplying 16,000 desserts a day to Etihad Airlines, we were working with Costa, it was, it was crazy. But it's always about the relationship, and I'm a big believer that, I mean, I was saying to you earlier, I have customers now at Saroos that I was working with five years ago, and they're like, we don't want to work with anyone else, we want to work with you. And yeah, okay, the cake can be good, the cake can be bad, but I will look after them, I will make sure they're okay, I will train their chefs, I will come and do their plating for them. It's not just, here's a box of cake, go. It's the whole package that makes it successful. You're welcome. A great question. Because in that, what you would say, is there any more pastry chefs in the room, by the way? 
Okay, okay. but you have a very defined position in the hotel hierarchy. You aren't like the rest of the chefs, you've got your own sort of area. You're in domain. Like, yeah. You're in domain and your own Don't stuff. Don't my section. Absolutely. Um, does that mean that it's difficult to move out a bit? Does that mean that you don't get the same respect or do you get more respect? What? I don't know. I'm just wondering, where, how do you get positioned in a normal hotel? Then? So I believe that pastry chefs are kind of always under the executive chef. And it's always been a bit of a why, because, okay, the executive chef is responsible for the menus. But hang on a second, the pastry chef is doing one third of all those menus as well. So what makes them less important than the executive chef? You know, they're always responsible for the afternoon tea, they're always responsible for the lobby lounge, they have to look after, you know, the banqueting desserts, blah, 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 blah. Pastry chefs generally get a hard time because they're told to look after everything, they're always given the least amount of staff, and no one cares about them. So for me, it's... We need to change to do care about you on this stage, there's a lot of love. So I feel that the pastry... Nine times out of ten, I don't know why, but pastry chefs are quite often females. So they have to fight that little bit harder to be heard and to be seen and to be like, whoa, you know, I'm over here, I'm creative. Let me help you in generating additional revenue streams. Executive chefs are like, oh, I've got to do budgets and finance and costings, and oh my god, my life sucks. And we're the ones that are like, well, I could, you know, create a ten meter tall chocolate fudge khalifa, and you can sell it. Should we do that? Okay, let's do that. You know, when I was at the address, I decided to build a gingerbread burj khalifa through three floors of the hotel. Wow. Don't ask me why. It was crazy, and I worked like six days without sleep, but it was great. And then, you know, they got a Guinness World Record, they got loads of publicity, PR, and it generated buzz and brought people to the hotel. But if I hadn't offered to it to, to do it, he would have been like, just go back into your little shop and you know stay away from me. You so, said gingerbread now. <laughs> She's got gingerbread going on. Is the lady bear wants to ask a question? I believe in the pink. Um, but she's doing stocks and shares. Stocks and shares at the moment. Yeah. Bitcoin at the moment. Any more questions? Because I want to ask you a very specific one. You got another question to ask as well. But if you want to get a position, that's great. But I want to ask you a question. Um, you touched on something there that most of the people I've been interviewing have been males in the industry, and in almost every industry, there's been um, it's been pointed out that it must be more fair. Now, I know that in the hotel hierarchy and certainly in the kitchen, it does tend to be a very brass and, and aggressive situation of getting the food ready on time. Just being honest, um, why aren't there more females involved in it? And do you think that there aren't enough females involved in it? And what would you do to change the face of, of the chef world to get more females there? So I strongly believe there isn't enough females. Right. I grew up with four brothers. So I had the upbringing that was like, you know, we're going to play football, either you're coming or you're not, kind of thing. There was no Barbie dogs, there was none of that. It was like, you're going to get dirty, you're going to get in the mud. So I was almost conditioned for it. Um, but I believe that there is stigma, you know, people believe that I was a really long, you know, that it's aggressive, it's verbal, it's abusive, but it's not like that at all. You know, if you go into a company or an environment where you're respected and you're loved, you can grow and flourish. Like, I coach the junior UAE culinary team, and we make sure that every single year we pick the team, there is at least one or two girls. Because we need them to experience the life, and we need to show other females that are coming up through the ranks, hey girls, you can do this too. But you do, I do believe in saying that you have to be very motivated and very strong-willed because there are going to be continuous barriers thrown in your face and you've got to overcome them. You know, last year alone I had four surgeries on my right hand, which was my pastry chef hand, and I taught myself to cook with my left hand because I had no choice. And, you know, I have surgery, two days later I'm back in the kitchen. Yes, I'm in a sling, but I'm telling the guys what to do. You know, you have to be resilient and, yeah, bad things are going to happen. You know, you're not going to have a day where you can just do eight hours and then trot home, you know, you might start early, you might finish late, but if you really want to do it and you want to be the best, then you'll push through and you'll do it. Absolutely, more bravo with that as well. Um, was the lady got up? There you go. You need a microphone, otherwise it doesn't work so just well. Just come up here. There you go. Yes. I, I just Googled your gingerbread bush honey, but that's fantastic. Um, a small question for you. Since you know the hotel industry, would a hotel accept to outsource from a small bakery, knowing that they have their own pastry chefs, they're paying them a lot of money to stay and to, and to create and bake. So how welcoming are they to outsource from? You'd be very, very surprised. Like I would say to you right now, I reckon about 80% of hotels are outsourcing, especially in pastry, because they can't find chefs with the right skill set. They can't handle the volumes. Um, 
you know, and it's the small pernickety things that they may not want to do, whereas you guys are doing it every day anyway, where you can come in and say, guys, I know you need beautiful cakes for your lobby lounge, you don't have a pastry chef right now, let me take care of that for you. So there's definitely a lot of ways. I was saying to, to David earlier that a lot of um, the big, big suppliers here, you know, that are supplying the slab cakes and the muffins and stuff like that, they don't necessarily understand the quality, but you can go and eat in an Epco petrol station and get the same cake that's being supplied to a five-star hotel. And that's a problem because we're, you know, hopefully not we, but hotels are outsourcing from places like Corica and the same cake is available across the region. And that for me is shocking. Like I'm not going to a five-star hotel to eat a cake that I can go and buy for 19 dirham and pay 80 for it over here. So it's giving them that bespoke, you know, hey, yeah, I'm gonna charge you nicely for this, but your lobby lounge is gonna look fantastic and it's consistent. So don't be afraid, don't be afraid to try. Go in there with some balls and be like, hey, I'm gonna give you this cake. They'll probably take it, and if they don't bring me, I'll come and help you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> a lot of visual stuff got buzz around there. Any more questions before we finish on this session? I mean, it's been really lively, some fascinating things we've touched on. Any more questions from the audience there? No? Well, with that, I've got one last thing I want to say. Where do you see the future of pastry chefs being? I mean, everything's evolved. We've found now that there's much more interest in comfort food. Uh, hopefully, we'll see more women getting it into the industry. We've already established through this great conversation already that you're a profit center, and once the accounts department have been told by the boss, yes, you will work with her or him or her, mainly her, then uh, things will move forward. Where do you see this becoming? Five years, ten years down the line? Do you see that you more stand alone? Or do you see that there'll be more integration or even removing it completely from hotels? No, I think the hotels would always have to have an aspect of the pastry department because they need that freshness. But I do hope that we don't see as many big giants in the market, you know, the French bakeries, the bake marts, etc. I you know, I want to see more medium-sized players that can offer that quality but at still at a decent price and giving the hotel something that they can expect. That's what I want to see. Fantastic. Well, wish you all the very best with that. And, uh, you and clearly, you're doing a great job. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking. And I can't <laughs> wait to catch up with you again. Uh, if you're around for a while, I'm sure there's lots of people like to talk to you who wouldn't want to go on the microphone. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Please put your hands together. Thank, Thank, you, very much. Much. Thank you so much. Two brilliant chefs to talk to in the time that we have uh, between now and the closure of this room. By the way, if you just come in, nice to see you. Welcome to uh, Chef Talks, specially dedicated to look at the way that the whole industry is going by taking some of the best practitioners and being able to talk to them about what it is that they're doing to make a huge difference. Our next guest on stage, and I can give a wave because he was ready to come on earlier. Good to see you. We're just checking out sanitizing as we should do with a COVID world, and swapping the microphones over to make sure we're ready for that. We're gonna be looking and discussing an incredible subject, which is all about the very basics of our food experience, and how we can use it to connect with each other. So, are we gonna swap the mic over as well? Is that, okay, it's been done, perfect. With that in mind, I'd like to put your hands together as we invite on our next guest uh, to join us here for Chef Talks. That's Camille Balut, the head chef of Hunter and Barrel. Oh, come on, a round of applause. It's a small room. There we go. Fantastic. I'm always worried that if we don't clap enough, one of the guests is going to come up and say, no, my agent said it would be busy and walk off. Because the thing is, with social distancing, we've got no choice. This is the numbers. But it's so good to see you. Hi. How are you? Fantastic. Are you? Thank you. So Hello. we're going to go down a journey. we just got to wait a moment because they're, they're on a sugar rush from the pastries and stuff at the moment. So we're gonna go down a journey where we're gonna be talking about the relationship people have with food and the connection that they have. Could you explain exactly what that means? Uh, let me introduce myself before. I'm uh, Camille Bolot, working for uh, Seagrass. I'm the head of culinary for the Middle East. Now working on uh, Hunter and Barrel Dubai. So uh, over uh, 28 years working with the uh, upscale establishment uh, in uh, Beirut, uh, including five stars. Uh, allow sorry, me just, to sorry, do one second. Excuse me, would you, would you mind? Thank you. Sorry. So at the same time working with the, uh, I'm uh, 
an uh, active member with the Académie Nationale de Cuisine. Also, I'm uh, the head of culinary for uh, University St. Joseph University in Beirut. So now, uh, working on Hunter and Barrel uh, Dubai, it's a new brand for seagrass coming to the Middle East, especially uh, to Dubai. So the connection will start from here, starting uh, combining the uh, Middle Eastern uh, taste with the Australian root to create this nice concept. It's a signature concept for the uh, seagrass. So that's why uh, I want to talk about this subject. Uh, I'll uh, make a small presentation sure. on uh, uh, Seagrass uh, company brands because it's uh, one of the uh, leading groups uh, in Sydney and all over uh, Australia. Uh, so uh, their uh, first venture to the Middle East in Dubai. Fantastic. Before we do the presentation, can we establish your role? Are you going to, oh, well, you're going to go through that. I was going to say, how did you yeah. get to be who you are? Yeah. This because is, then everyone can place it, but please, it's already built yeah, in. Yeah, this is, uh, I was talking about this uh, introduction. So, uh, By the way, you've got a very George Clooney look about you. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm jealous. But please, Thank carry you. on. Okay, uh, this is seagrass. No, go back, go back, go back, yeah. go back. Tell us about your history. Tell us how you got to be in a position. Because one of the things that we talk about is, the, is how chefs get to be at the level yeah. that you're you at. Know, because it, that journey is so important. Yeah, you, you know, um, our um, industry is very hard. Uh, you have to work for long hours. I started my uh, uh, career in uh, 1992 during my um, uh, studying uh, hotelry. So I start uh, uh, training in one of the biggest hotels in Beirut and start growing by time. So uh, this is uh, very important to keep uh, working on yourself by uh, attending special uh, uh, courses, by visiting exhibitions like here and um, attending uh, uh, seminars, all this. So uh, working with the big leaders uh, and uh, upscale establishment all over the world, not, not only in Lebanon, I'm talking about any chef, this will lead, will lead any chef to uh, build a good career, to uh, continue his uh, uh, growth or going in this business. Can I ask you a question? Sorry to interrupt. Because I think that's a very valid point. When you are setting yourself up to, to go on this journey, you have to make some difficult decisions about leaving properties to go and get that experience around the world, which has led to what you're doing right now. Yeah. How difficult is it, and when should you make those kind of decisions? Um, sure, you have to, uh, to build your career and experience, but this will not come if you work with uh, a company or establishment like one or two years, you have to, to commit with, with your uh, uh, company. But when you have a chance for a new challenge, this is the time that you have to leave or to move. Because in this case, you will get more experience and you will be getting the um, uh, chance to, to grow. So, would you suggest with that, that you're better off staying with one organization and traveling around the world through them, like a hotel chain, yeah. or would you suggest that you, you're better off creating your own career path? I, I would say it's good to move from time to time, but you have to commit to your company. So, uh, if you have uh, a certain level of, of responsibility, this allows you to stay minimum five to six years in each company. So, before that, I think it's, you're losing time. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to know, because it's, it's yeah. very interesting. So now you're going to share with us the next stage. So uh, Seagrass, um, it's an Australian-based company. Uh, it's a hospitality group uh, specialized uh, in uh, creating uh, uh, superior and innovative hospitality and uh, restaurant concepts. So uh, they are running now, uh, operating uh, like uh, seven brands. One of, uh, of them, the Meat and Wine Co. Uh, it's a steakhouse, high-end steakhouse. Six Head, it's a really fine dining restaurant, a very nice place. Uh, the Italian uh, street kitchen. Uh, the Five Guys, they have the Five Guys in Australia. Rips and Burger, it's a QSR uh, a place. Also, they serve high-end product. 
the butcher and the farmer, and the last is the uh, hunter and barrel. This is the concept will be opening soon, next month, in uh, the Vida Hotel, uh, Emirates Hills. So uh, this uh, general look about uh, seagrass. Now let's move to first branch for hunter and barrel in uh, Sydney. As you can see, you can see the uh, lots of food. It's very uh, natural and relaxing place. Wood and leather and steel. Uh, the place full full of barrels. It's uh, for aging. They age their own. Uh, uh, beverages, so it's really a uh, very um, comfortable place. Now, I'm I'm going to show you some pictures of the branch will be in Dubai, so it it will be a bit surprising because we took this the uh, natural uh, product with some innovation and uh, make it in a modern way to fit Dubai market. Of course, um, taking into consideration all the roots and the uh, uh, key element. This is Dubai Virgin. You can see the uh, lights from the net of the uh, fisherman. Looks beautiful. Uh, you can see the uh, falcon above the bar, it's uh, all made by natural wood. And of course, the uh, seating, it's a very nice place. Now, when you're putting something together, um, as, as beautiful as this, how much is the involvement of yourself? How much is it in designers? Because they all look different, but they've got to be workable. So yeah. how much is the chef's input? How much is the, the management input? How does that work yeah. up? Each one has his own role. My role to combine the two culture with two tastes, let's say, between Australia and Middle East to come out with a nice menu that fits the uh, uh, residents' taste and taking into consider consideration the concept, identity, and uh, uh, NDA, or, or DNA, sorry. So uh, we keep everything uh, in place but fit any market uh, we're going to open with. So how many hunter and barrels are there around the world? Now uh, we have uh, in Sydney, Perth, and uh, 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 Melbourne. And the fourth will be in Dubai. But we're going to open many in the Middle East, Dubai, Fantastic. Abu Dhabi, and all the region. Why would you consider hunter and barrel to be something that would be a brand that would really take off in this part of the world? Yeah, as, as I have said, it's a, a signature brand for the company. It's a very nice combination and it's a casual dining restaurant. So it fits uh, all the generation and can uh, receive family and friends in comfortable and uh, um, not very nice environment. So it's easy to dine in and have fun. Okay, lovely. So, um, Hunter and Barrel, we focus on primal culinary experience. What, what does that mean for us? Uh, usually, um, we focus on the product itself. So whenever you want to make any uh, menu item or uh, recipe or anything, you have to uh, select the, uh, uh, the, the, the right ingredient for, from the right source uh, that uh, fits uh, standard specification and food safety, take con into consideration all these uh, specs. So uh, this is very important to, uh, to uh, bring into practice. At the same time, uh, we're using a high quality of uh, meat, um, selected cuts, starting from uh, Wagyu uh, from Australia, uh, ending with the uh, USDA from uh, America, uh, with the wide selection of cuts, uh, let's say the three types of uh, beef tenderloin filet, ribeye, and the uh, D-Ram strip loin. Uh, also, you can have the T-bone and the tomahawk. 
So uh, the, all these uh, uh, kind of steaks, uh, grilling on uh, natural uh, wood charcoal, uh, which gives the, the uh, um, a smoky taste. You know, it's uh, very natural. So this is, will be added value. At the same time, it's very important how you're going to use or grill this uh, meat. The, the way you're doing or using your product is very important. It's not always about getting the uh, expensive product to, uh, uh, to serve a good food. It's important to uh, follow st right steps from aging till grilling, it, the, especially the meat. Meat must rest well before grilling. Um, and uh, chefs know very well uh, how many days uh, the process should be from and the degree should be on, etc. Now, so, terms, I'm going to throw a question at you because I'm fascinated by it. If you go to certain fast food restaurants around the world, you get the same quality, whether it's quality or not quality is a decision, but it's exactly the same that's uniform everywhere. When you're opening up a brand like this, people will want to have the same quality and the same flavor. That's not an easy thing to do with different chefs and different countries, and different ingredients and different, different supplies. How do you make it uniform so everyone gets the same experience wherever they go? Yeah, this is a very important question. When you have um, a very, a very uh, well-established company, you have to build that from scratch. What does that mean? The, your own recipe, your own standard, so you have to follow. There is standard for every recipe and uh, every step. Uh, whatever uh, is the branch or uh, where is the place, uh, everything is centralized with the head office online. You can uh, see everything, and the chef, uh, his role to follow up on every step and uh, uh, um, making sure that every recipe applying the same standard as should be. So you say following up online, is that just following up ingredients online to make sure, or do you, or do you actually observe what's going on? Because you can't taste test over that kind of distance. Yes, no. Uh, every, every branch has a head chef. Right. So uh, this chef uh, must attend training before, uh, before start uh, the opening, preparation for the opening. So uh, that's why he has enough knowledge to, not, to run his place according to the uh, uh, standard, the company standard. Sure. So that's why I'm, I'm saying the chef has a big role in terms of uh, choosing the product uh, as per specs because every item has, uh, has specs or uh, reference to follow. That's why um, his role is very important inside sure. the kitchen. Sure. OK. So uh, before that, I would like to say uh, uh, something about the seating. So basically, uh, we have different seating in, in our concept. Uh, we have four seatings. We can, we can receive um, anyone. At, uh, uh, what we call the friend and family means um, uh, couples or family can uh, enjoy our seating. We have the lounge. We have the uh, bar. We have the dining area. And we have uh, private rooms as well for special event, uh, dinner, or lunch. We uh, open from 12 till midnight, so anyone can have uh, his meal anytime. Welcome for everyone at, at all time. So uh, this uh, point uh, uh, makes the, the clients uh, f feeling comfortable in this place because there is a different seating can enjoy it. Well, we're asking some questions, uh, and as always, opening up to the audience, if they ask to ask, uh, like to ask any questions, if you do want to, then just put your hand up so we can see where you are, and have a microphone um, available for you over just here. So I'd like to ask you, when you're putting together a concept for, for a, a new restaurant that's along the lines of what we're talking of Hunter and Barrow or any of these other different places, what do you look for? Do you look to see if it's comparing to stuff that's already in the market? Or do you look to see if there's something completely different that you want to fill as a gap? And if so, what's the process you go to design something like that? In my opinion, first you have to, to see the market need. 
you don't have to follow anyone. You have to, you create, uh, you can create your own concept, but uh, you have to see what is the gap in the market and you fill it. It's better than following uh, other brands or, yeah. And so when you do that, what are the stages? Because it's a huge, it's a huge planning process. I, I used to work with Marriott many years ago. When I first moved to Dubai about 30 years ago, I was in the JW, which unfortunately is now closed in Deira. But when we opened, they, they brought out a number of signature um, brands, you know, the uh, Italian restaurant, they brought out a, a steakhouse and so on. But the planning that went in and the testing and the, the cutlery even, and the way that they served it and all the rest of it, these are long processes. How long would it take to produce a concept before you actually roll it out to the, to the customers? It must uh, take minimum uh, a year, minimum. So uh, it's, it's a whole experience. You can't, you can't build a concept on a menu or in a design. It's a, it's a whole experience from the door to the end. Uh, the customer must enjoy every single detail in the restaurant. The cutlery, the table, the furniture, the ambience, the, the, the lighting, the music. Music, let's say, is a very important issue in the restaurant. Bef all these things before the food. So, and you have to enjoy your meal or and your meal with some dessert and coffee and it's a whole experience. Well, that experience is, is sadly what's missing in a lockdown world. In Dubai, they are open, restaurants are open with social distancing. And as we look at the audience in here, it's really hard to build up an atmosphere when you know you've got a half or a quarter or a third of the rooms, tables are gonna be filled. So. From the point of view of design, a, designing a restaurant, how do you get around that problem? Because it's all, it, the only reason that people are going to go out to play is that experience. Yeah. But if that experience has almost been handcuffed to make it less easy, what can you do to step it up? Uh, you know, uh, now we, ha we are in, in a special case. So we have to accommodate with, with all the changes now happening. So you can, you can make your uh, seating uh, more uh, spacey and uh, uh, you, take, you, can, you take out some uh, tables and uh, you have to create a comfortable environment for the, for the, for the guest, otherwise we have problem. But it's a, a period and we have to pass it all together we have to, to, to put an effort to finish it uh, safely. Well, exactly. It's a, it's a difficult thing because, I mean, we've had numerous chefs coming up uh, talking about their venues, their restaurants, and so on. Do you worry that this might see, um, in many ways, the death of restaurants if we don't see a change? I say this from a point of view. It's very difficult financially yeah. to run a restaurant in these times when in many cases, the actual finances just go to keep the running of the event, running of the venue, yeah. as opposed to actually making profit. Do you see a big change in the market, or do you think it's a temporary thing? Uh, I think it's a um, it's very challenging time now for the restaurants. Yes, they have, I wish all of them can sustain this period, but uh, yes, some change will, will happen. Okay, with that, any more questions from the room? Because we always like to throw it open to the audience to be able to ask any question in particular. We, we, we don't at this stage. So, sorry, go. No, no, I just want to thank you. No, it's great. We haven't finished yet, so you can't leave quite yet. I wanted to look at the, the way that you see the industry going in the future. Because for many people, the online relationship that has now become flourishing with, um, with um, ordering to eat food at home and dining from home, which in many ways is temporary, but in other ways it's something that people are getting used to. How can that experience be enhanced? So if you've got people ordering from your restaurants and, it del and you deliver through whatever delivery service, what can be done to make that experience better for the people at home? Because that's a major part of, of the food experience now. I think now most of the restaurants working on the delivery, even if fine dining restaurants start putting plan for delivery menu and all this. Uh, this experience can be better by working from my point of view, by working on the packaging. 
because the packaging is, is an issue with the uh, delivery. Sometimes you receive your food soggy, sometimes you receive it um, cold. At the same time, I would suggest for the chefs or for whomever working on delivery menu, he should try and taste and keep trying trial and error till he gets the right product, the finished product delivered prop properly delivered, let's say, let's say, because you can't cook and taste and you say, oh, this is good. You have to eat it after a minimum half an hour to imagine how the client received, will be receiving this item and how it looked like. So this is a very important thing. Now, on a slightly different note, for those people who do go into a restaurant and we do like the whole dining experience, which at the end of the day has to be enhanced now to make people want to do it, what would you suggest that restaurants can do to step it up? It's always a great thing when the chef wanders around and asks everybody how their food is. That's yeah. obviously a great way of doing it. Have you got any more tips for people who are restaurateurs or still looking to be able to enhance the relationship they have with customers from your, your experience that they could do just to step up that relationship with the dining experience and the new customers? You know, it's always uh, uh, to have um, uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, um, table visit. The people feel more comfortable while eating or someone, uh, especially the chef itself, coming uh, to uh, ask about their food. They feel more comfortable and they, they trust this uh, place more. So it's very important thing that this table visits to, to keep uh, the relationship with the customer. Then uh, later, uh, by, by time, the, the chef will know this client like this meat, uh, his meat, this uh, cooking level, uh, this, so, you know. Absolutely. One final question, unless we've got one from the audience. No? One final question. And this is about the future of dark kitchens. And we mentioned dark kitchens a couple of times throughout today, which is the idea of concept of that basically there might be a better business model just keeping the kitchen for making food as opposed to even looking at the dining experience for the time being. One of the things that I look at is chefs having their own TV show to be able to show people these are the types of food that we're making today, would you like to order it? So that's a great way of creating a relationship with, um, with your customers wherever they are in the region. Do you think that's something that chefs would embrace? Do you think it's something that people would go, oh, I don't want to be in front of the camera? Because it's very rare to find a chef that doesn't like to talk a lot. So what no, do you no, think? I think it's a character. Some of them has this character to talk in front of the camera and they like the, the show and the cooking, playing with the ingredients, all this. And some of them, uh, like me, I don't like to, to talk much in front of the oh, camera. I've had you for about 25 minutes, yeah, so you've yeah. done well. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's a character. Uh, I feel like um, I like to, to, to concentrate more on uh, the way uh, using ingredients and all this inside the kitchen, thinking about new ideas, new recipes, more than uh, talk and uh, making sure. So let the words come out through the dishes and people yeah. can taste yeah, what you're yeah. going to say. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Me too. And thank, thank you for you. sharing all those different insights. Please put your hands together. Is that Chef uh, Camille Baloud. <laughs> thank you so much. dive into the entire industry and if I read you the title of what we're going to be reviewing next you'll just go "Ooh, it's going to get juicy we're going to be looking at getting the job done without stepping on your clients toes in brackets too much straight talk in an environment of high stress big egos and cutthroat competition are we talking about hospitality or are we talking about pirates or does the two mix together? Our next guest and our final one for this afternoon is Chef Vanessa Bamer from Chef Bamer Consultancy. We'd like to come and join us. Round of applause. Thank you. Wonderful. If you'd like to grab that one there. No, we don't do that. We do that bit. There you go. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, 
I feel like I'm in some sort of hip hop, you know, video doing all this kind of stuff, but it's kind of weird. Either that or you're going to start Zuma classes. I'm not doing Zuma classes. I barely get back on my seat. So <laughs> with that, your title is so provocative. Let's establish who you are first before we d deep dive. So if you can share with everybody how you come to be in the position you are and what it is that you do before we deep dive into the industry. I'd be happy to do so. Uh, my name is Chef Vanessa Bema. I started in this industry when I was 13 years old at a mom and pop's pizzeria in the United States. I fell in love with the concept of being able to show passion and creativity through something you could eat because, you know, the best way to anyone's heart is through their stomachs. Um, after that, I actually was in law school. I was a certified paralegal for a very large law firm and working on the side during uni years at a, I guess you'd say it's a catering company that did golf courses. I found that I really enjoyed the business aspect of working at the law firm, but I enjoyed making people's events come true and keeping everyone happy when I was doing my side gig. So it came to a day, I told my dad, dad, I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to work at the law firm anymore. I want to go to culinary school and I want to be dealing with people's emotions through food. He wasn't very happy about that, uh, but he was also a consultant. So he advised me to go work in the industry for a while and become a consultant. And that's what brings us here today. Fantastic. Now I'm just going to say, because that, that falls into place for what it is that you do so much now, because your ability to take an objective view of the, the legitimacy of the industry and what people should be doing must come from your legal background then. Exactly. That's why a lot of times uh, when co uh, clients come to me, I have very strong beliefs that they should review contracts and they're like, well, how do you know all this stuff? It's because I have quite a big background being a certified paralegal. So let's take the, the lid off the industry. Is it in a bit of a mess when you arrive and what do you do to fix it? We should get see my facial expressions right now. Um, you can take your mask <laughs> off, you can take your mask off. There you go, much better. Hi everybody, how are I you? Have applause as we see who we're talking to. You know what, I'm so used to it. I didn't even know we had a mask on. No <laughs> offense, but I'm so used to talking to people like that. So please carry on. So basically when clients come to us, they're at their last string. We do have two different aspects of it where we have clients that want to start something and they have no idea about the industry and they're looking for help, which is what we would expect from someone when they're entering into a new field. We also have clients that are struggling, especially with COVID that's happening at the moment, who they, they think they need to close down. They don't know how to restructure. They try changing their menu three, four, five times without doing the correct research about FCR, which for the layman, it's food cost ratios. In the past, food cost ratio was supposed to be at a 33.3%. But now everything's done on aggregators, Deliveroo, Zumato. So we have a lot of people from different backgrounds and different positions that we need to connect with and find out what they really need and what they really want versus what they think they need and what they think they want. Can we just ask you on that point? So many businesses are hemorrhaging um, profit, potential profit, just because they've changed the menu because they think it will suit better I mean, it just doesn't become cost effective. I mean, didn't do the research before they got there. Exactly. So a lot of we, things that we have here in Dubai is a copycat system. There's not a problem with doing a copycat system if you see something you really like and want to bring life to it. But the problem is, is that you don't research your ingredients and you have a home business and you're running to buy your flour from Spinney's versus going to IFCO this is where you're going to run into a problem. Because at the end of the day, if you're not aware of where you're getting your produce, whose staff that you have, wastage, it doesn't matter how beautiful your product is. Your percentage of profit is going to be minimal. So when we're looking at this, is this, would this be something that affects the big hotels or affects the smaller businesses? I've got the feeling like if you're in a big hotel, you've probably got a bigger team for looking at procurements and you've had more experience of getting access to the right kind of pricing and so on. Is that true or do you find it's across the board people get it wrong? I will have to say that it happens more often than not with the smaller startups. The larger hotel chains 
kind of have their systems in place. But a lot of times when it comes to even restaurants and hotels, where they start cutting cost is the quality of the food and the staff. So what happens is, is it doesn't matter how big your chain is and your marketing, if you remove the product value and the quality, you're not gonna get repeat customers. So then they start squeezing more. So before where you got a Wagyu steak, it starts moving down the grades until it's not edible. I'm sure you guys have all experienced it. Um, the food blogger, I'm sure she has as well. A restaurant opens up, best chef, great food, and all of a sudden starts diminishing, and the corporates in charge and the restaurant managers, they start squeezing in the wrong areas when in actuality it should be more of a pump of marketing and keeping your quality high. Well, I remember a situation when I, I mean, I first started off working in, in the Marriott Hotel when I came here about 30 years ago. Me too. Uh, did you really? Not here, but in Florida, yeah. Oh, what, with neighbors? With well, Marriott. With huge <laughs> thousands of miles of distance. Oh, it's the other side of the pond. It doesn't matter. Uh, so anyway, I was working in a sports bar. I was doing entertainments in there. I remember one particular evening, the, the, the head chef came into, uh, the food and beverage director, came into the kitchen, uh, and he was on a bit of a mission, turned around to the chef who was running the venue and said, how long has the meat been in here? He said, from yesterday, he said, right, in the bin, all of it. He wanted it fresh every single day because that's how they run the, the venue. And I think that that obviously hit me because the chef was like that because obviously it scares his numbers because he's trying to make it all balanced. But the, the quality of what they wanted to deliver, even if a sports bar had to be of a certain quality. Now, the reason I bring this up as a subject is when you look at the amount of people who are jumping into that world and saying, we've got a really nice dish, let's just get it out there amongst the community and people can buy. And there's a lot to be said for that, but the food standards are never going to be at the level that protects the customer. So they must come to you and say, can I set up a business? And you must come back and say, mm, no. Uh, well, you know, we were raised always to never say no to customers in the service industry. Being a consultant, we have to say no. We have to make it realistic for them because the last thing you want to do is promise the sun, moon, and stars and know in your deep of your heart that they're not going to be able to reach that. So in reference to what you just mentioned, that the chef was upset because they wanted to throw out all the meat, all right, that, that's, that's now you've just made a mistake. It wasn't the chef's fault and it wasn't the owner's fault. It was the procurement officer's fault because there are no SOPs, standard operating procedures in place. These are the things that consultants provide. These are the things that need to be put into place so that we don't have this additional wastage. A lot of the clients that come to me, especially during COVID, would be like, I have a cook at home license and I make the absolutely best vine leaves. That's fabulous. I try the vine leaves, it tastes great. I ask her, what is this costing you to make? Oh, well, I have no idea. What, what do you mean you don't know how much it's costing you to make? Oh, I don't know. I just go to Spinney's and I buy all the items, but I want to get a restaurant and I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to sell it for one dirham a piece. I tell her, okay, let's, let's just play for a second. I pull out my forms and I say that if you're going to be doing delivery, you have to pay for the delivery driver. You have to pay for the aggregator. You have to pay for the food cost. You have to pay for the staff. Okay? The lights, the rent, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the day, you're not going to make money off of this unless you sell each piece for three dirhams. She goes, well, why would I do that? And I say to her, I don't know why you would do that. You have a successful business running it out of your home kitchen. Sometimes bigger is not better, especially during COVID when everything is delivery. There are so many cloud kitchens now not just Katopi, but other cloud kitchens as well, or rental kitchen space that gives you the licensing, gives you the staff, and you're able to produce your product. And this is really the future, is cloud kitchens. That's a, you answered the question for me, I was gonna say, because um, during the last year or so, one of the great things about this entire industry is it, it kept us all alive. I mean, the deliveries and everything else, and our ecosystem now, in my house, I'm sure it's the same for many other people, is we're just kind of used to ordering food in when we don't want to cook. I'm but, guilty but, of that, very, very guilty. I, I'm a chef and I do it. But it's just a comfortable truth. It arrives um, for a, a great price, a lot less than it would be to go out and dine. You don't have to move, you can just order it and it arrives. That's a growth area and I don't see that easily going back into its box. Even when we've got less COVID, people now 
part of that world. I completely agree with that. If it doesn't only apply to food as well, you can have somebody pick up your laundry, you can have someone deliver your groceries. This is the future of our industry. And at the end of the day, we have to adapt and flow with the way that things are moving. Even with COVID over, as you mentioned, it's cheaper for me to order a cheeseburger than for me to go out and buy all of the ingredients at a supermarket, take the time and effort for me to put it together, cook it, clean up after myself, or have my husband clean up after me. Um, but at that point, we have to realize that there are so many different concepts that approach us, as well as every chef that I know at this moment have decided they're consultants. Oh yeah, so I, you know, I've worked as a pizza guy, and now I want to consult you about how uh, you should open your restaurant. Okay, that's, that's good, I'm glad, but the problem being is, is that there's a lot of consultancies out there that when the client comes, they say, yes, I can do that. I, of course, I can do that. Oh, I, I have no idea what, what your concept is, but I can do it. And they're promising the world without being able to provide that. So now the clients have this idea that anything is possible. So when you do tell them no, they're like, well, what do you mean? This so-and-so said that it can be done. So we have to be very careful when we communicate with clients to not break their dreams, but remold their dreams into a vessel that it'll fit into. But here's the problem, and I know it from my own industry, because I used to be a DJ, and I used to DJ around town, travel around the world, do big gigs, and here's where the problem came along. People would do it cheaper than you just to get the gig, Oh, all the time. And then they do it for free just to be seen. And it was a race to the bottom to work for free just to be seen at events. Now, when you're talking about chefs or people in the, in the industry who are setting up as a consultant, just to get the first few clients under their belt and then maybe start charging is a real problem for the people like yourself who've been around for a while. You have set prices. I had to stop DJing. It just didn't make sense financially anymore. How do you manage to keep that quality up without compromising where you are? Well... I will have to say that at the very beginning, we did take a lot of assignments undervalued of what we were worth. And it took my cousin to sit me down, who has been running the planning headquarters, the events company, for over 20 years. Is Hubby going to give us a wave, or is he hiding? Where is he hiding? Yeah, that, that's, that's the gentleman that uh, supports me in everything I do. He is my muscle. Give us a wave. <laughs> Here you go. Hi. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, so you know three people waved at that point. I don't yeah. want to start staring it up, but look, we're still waiting. No, that's, that's Chef Amro, who also works with us. No, um, it's okay. We don't need to know. It's okay. It's like, all right, Karen. <laughs> um, so back to the, the, the replay about the question yeah, sure. uh, regarding if it's difficult when there's new client, uh, new consultants out in the market who are competing for jobs and undervaluing our work. At first, it was upsetting. It was quite upsetting because we work really hard and we invest our time and effort. And even though our scope of work is A through F, we give A through Z. We want to see this succeed. I don't have my own restaurant, but through the 50 outlets that I've done here in the Middle East, as well as Asia and the United States, I've lived, my recipes are living and breathing in other people's restaurants. It was hard, but it became a point where we took a step back and we explained to the client why you should come with us. This is our history. We will tell you this is what will work, this is what not. If you decide to come with us, fabulous. We're going to charge what the value is of our experience. We have with our chefs over 30 years combined experience all around the world. If you'd like to go with someone else, we're here when that doesn't work. We get calls, the clients come back and call us because we didn't just cut them off. We explained, if you do this, this is what will happen. If you decide to do this, thank you very much. When this happens, we will help you fix this, but we won't be involved in you digging a hole for yourself. A lot of clients, unfortunately, don't see the realization of that until they've sank 300,000, 500,000 dirhams into a consultant and a concept that isn't working. 
Well, the bottom line is more important now than possibly it's ever been because money is tighter. I'm just saying that in this particular industry, people have to eat as opposed to the events industry where people can't go out in the same way. But I'd like to know what area do you concentrate on most nowadays? Are you fixing broken business models? Are you setting up new ones? What takes up most of your time? Uh, currently, what's taking up most of our time is restructuring failing restaurants, chains, and introducing small businesses into how to integrate their products into the aggregator market. Um, a lot of clients think that it's just easy to get signed up with Zaboni, excuse me, with Zumato and all of the other aggregators, but in actuality, you have to readjust all of your food costs, all of your recipes, and maybe take some things off the menu because if it's a sit-down cafe, you might be able to sell that honey cake for a certain price, but with delivery, you end up losing money. A lot of these clients do not have FCR calculations. They, they've never thought of it. They just had a good product and wanted to buy it, and it's been working because they've been selling, so they didn't see how much they're losing on wastage and the aggregators and everything else. Um, also, too, with events being completely <laughs> non-existent, um, there has been a big influx for private family gatherings and events uh, that we've been called out to. Not always allowed. Uh, if it's, it's first member family up to 10. Okay. So currently it has to be first relatives, mom, dad, son, daughter. Um, obviously we have had gotten calls for people who are clearly not related. Uh, which is unfortunate because they usually get raided, which I'm telling everyone now, be very careful. Uh, we were on a yacht the other day and it did get raided. Thankfully, they were all family, but guys, this is serious. We're not going to get rid of COVID until we start following the rules. True. So with that, when people are talking about putting together um, a new concept, what are you finding is a concept? Are people starting now with Dark Kitchen? Are they still thinking about getting a premises and the, the, the layout of a restaurant and so on? Because not everybody, like our previous um, guest, has a big hotel chain or a big company behind them. They're starting off and every penny comes out of their credit card. So what are they going for now? Well, actually, I'm glad that you asked that question because the current client that we're working with, as well as two others, are exploring the dark kitchen aspect. Now, one of the clients has been very smart about it. They currently have a concept that's doing strictly delivery, no dine-in. They've decided to, instead of invite another dark kitchen concept, they want to open up a separate brand inside their two central kitchens that they're already running. They did all their due diligence, they saw on the market that they wanted to do certain items, and they've picked and moved forward with that, which is the way to enter the market if you're not already familiar with what is there and what's going on, is doing your due diligence. A lot of dark kitchen concepts, a lot of unrealistic people calling up saying that they want to do the best burger in town from a dark kitchen, but they don't want to pay any money and they want the dark kitchen to take a percentage of their sales. These type of things is when we have to tell the clients that you know you wanna make money, you have to invest money. Even with the dark kitchen, there's not many places that will allow you to come occupy their space, use their staff, and only take 10% of your sales. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna open it up to any questions from the audience, by the way, before I come into the, the next question. I think one of the things that Vanessa brings to the table is a real overview of the entire industry. And I know that she charges a lot of money normally, so you got it for free. So <laughs> grab her now and ask those questions before. Not saying that you shouldn't book her time as well. Um, the question I wanted to ask next is, what happens to a venue when they go dark kitchen and the restaurant is pretty much empty and there's, there's no traffic or footfall that goes through? Um, what do you advise them to do with that extra space? Wait until it gets back because it's going to cost them a fortune. So what should they do with that extra space? Well, if the kitchen goes dark, what we typically tell them to do is to close up the front of house so that you run minimal electricity, uh, air con, et cetera, to bring your bills down. Now, granted, 
your landlord's not going to give you a discount if you're only running your kitchen. So what we do with a lot of uh, dark kitchens or current establishments that are looking to move to dark kitchen, we do advise to rent a small area so that someone else can come in and rent that space. But we, we don't really believe in profit share because that never works out well for anyone. Somebody's going to fall out and somebody's yeah, going to have a problem. Yeah, it's usually what happens, unfortunately. When you're talking to different parts of the industry, it must be a massive problem having arguments and calming down people because <laughs> it has been known in the industry for a few people to get heated. How do you deal with that? Are you a martial artist? Do you carry a big stick? Does husband walk around and, and, <laughs> and bounce for you as we go? I, I have my uh, the, the big, big man with a big stick. Uh, so basically, in the, there is a lot of big egos demanding people. The one thing that I have learned in this industry in the time that I've spent in it is patience, all right? A steam kettle can only go off for so long. And the point being is, is that if you allow someone to scream at you, you have just given them permission to disrespect you. So as soon as a client gets uppity and you say, excuse me, I refuse to be spoken to like that, when you're calm, I will speak with you. They get a shock. Well, how dare you speak to me like that? You're a woman how, or you're, I, I pay you. Well, great, but if you want to solve this problem, you need to calm down. We need to look at this rationally. This shocks most people to stop and they get embarrassed. Because usually when people are heated, and I'm sure you guys have gotten in arguments, friends, family, that guy across the street that keeps walking his dog on your lawn, the idea being is, is that a person can't argue with themselves. And to walk away from a situation while putting your foot down, they calm down very quickly. Now afterwards, you don't berate, you say, great, I'm very glad, I see that you're upset, let's discuss why you're upset. It's I should have been a psychologist. I don't know. Um, well, you are clearly with a, <laughs> with a restaurant flavor to it. Exactly. It. And then what you do is you speak with the clients to find out what they're feeling inside. It's usually anger or frustration. And you start to build together avenues of how we can fix the problem. Now, granted, they might not want to fix it the way that you think that they should fix it, but you've heard them at that point. There are some clients that will not calm down, but their partners usually kind of go, okay, now you're embarrassing yourself. So the idea being is, is that you have to remember everybody acts differently. Everybody, we're, we're universal. We're like M&Ms, every color. All right. The way that I speak to one client is completely different than a way I speak to another. You have to learn that person. You are not fixing their business. You are helping them grow as business people and as restaurateurs or as chefs. You have to teach them how to deal with other people. Even when we do with uh, consultations and trainings of chefs, listen, we're all hot-headed. I used to be very hot-headed. If I'm not able to get him to calm down and understand what his employee is going through, he'll never be able to work with them. So once you have your client, you're not building the business only. You're developing a person. From your experience, I mean, how long have you been in Dubai? About nine years now. Okay. Um, from your experience of the rest of the world and, uh, and what you hear and what you see and what you read about and so on, how does, Dubai's, how does the, the Dubai um, food industry compare to other places? Because certainly this book, which I was donated today, which is great, which is the best of Dubai book, oh, is lovely. all about Dubai wanting to be the very best and it was to be the very best of everything, what do you see as the challenges that people would face here to be able to lay claim to that? Um, in the food and beverage industry, from my experience, the biggest problem Dubai has is it's a copycat. Um, excluding our good friends Nick and Scott, most chefs and restaurants that come here is already an established icon of other places. The few homegrown concepts that we have had here have been fantastic. They've kept the original concept, the chefs, and have grown with it and expanded. Unfortunately, when it comes to other industries, they see a concept that they like, they bring in a chef for one year, get it up and running, fire everybody, then bring in lower staff, 
lower quality of food and expect it to keep running. If Dubai wants to be on the cutting edge to be competing with the rest of the world, we need to get out of that mentality. Start looking for our own homegrown Dubai chefs or expats that come and make Dubai their home to be able to make new concepts, new flavors, and new ideas that's original to Dubai. So with that, do you see there being a drive for that to be a reality, or do you think it's still going to be a challenge because of the... I mean, I'm not going to say there's arrogance in Dubai, but there is a lot of arrogance that we have. I'm, I'm as guilty as everybody else. We do want to be seen as the best. The rest of the world looks at Dubai and goes, wow. And the, the reality can often be different on the ground. Do you think that the egos are a big problem for that to be a reality? I think that the egos were a big problem, and they still tend to be. But I believe that between now and two years ago, especially with COVID waking everyone up to the reality of our actual future and situation, that that's changing. I've seen a lot of chefs that have been at the same jobs for a very long time strike out on their own. I've seen a lot of restaurateurs starting to try to develop new, innovative cuisines and concepts. You know, um, we're no longer able to just make it by Everything now needs to be an experience, it needs to be unique. I believe that if we work together in the industry, we can keep those egos at bay to a certain point and become a real hub like we're meant to be. Absolutely. Do we have any questions from the audience? Because it's a great opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to look at that. Because what I want to ask next is, one of the unique things about Dubai is the UAE really looks after its citizens. And That's so true. there's a donation for starting a new business that I don't know exists like that in any other country. And a large amount of them do turn into restaurants. And you will get a lot of people saying, I want a restaurant. And you're going to say, well, what do you want it to be? I don't know. I want a restaurant. Yes. So where do you guide that? Because at the end of the day, it's got to be successful. How do you find that success and what do you suggest to people? Well, whenever we have someone who comes and they say they want to have a restaurant, but they have no concept of what they want, we sit them down and we say, all right, what is it that you envision yourself to be doing in five years? And people are like, well, what do you mean? I want to be on the side of the beach. I'm like, then you don't want a restaurant. You want a delivery concept because that's something you can step away and hire people to take care of you. Like, oh, okay, I didn't quite understand that. So back to what I was saying about learning about the person. A lot of people want the restaurant because they want the glitz and glamour of, oh, well, you know, this is the best bar in Dubai and I go with my friends and we hang out. That's not what a restaurant is. Restaurants hard work. For those in the audience that work in the restaurant industry or have in the past, you know it's hard work. It's every day, all day, admin. You're not going to get to sit with your friends at your restaurant and sip tea. Whenever we have these guests or clients that come in, we try to show them the reality do you like catering? Okay, this is a concept for this. Do you like entertaining people? Then you should definitely be a private chef. Oh, okay, well, you know, if you want to have a lounge, this is the money that's going to take to put it in. You're not going to see a return for at least a year and a half, two years down the line if you're successful. Is this the time and effort that you're wanting to put into a situation? So it's really about sitting them down and getting them to think about what they're getting themselves into. Well, final question then, um, which is about where things are going to be. We've seen hotels taking a little bit of a bashing right now Ugh. because people aren't staying in hotels, not dining there, and so on. But traditionally, in a place like Dubai, hotels have been essential because of the fact, I'm not knocking hotels for that, because of the fact that under a hotel umbrella, you've got... A, um, a concept worldwide, a support system worldwide. You've got a number of different outlets that can be in that place. And so therefore, the ecosystem tends to be cost effective. Do you think in a post-COVID world, you're going to get a lot more standalone restaurants as opposed to bringing it under the, the, the one hotel? Or where do you see things going? We've already mentioned dark kitchens. Is that the way forward? Or where do you see this blend going to be in future cities like Dubai? That's an excellent question. I'm going to have to give some thought about that one. Well, you've got 30 seconds. Okay, <laughs> 30 seconds on my thought. Take as long as you want. I, as as you want. I will have to say when it comes to that, it's 
always safer to be under an umbrella of an established mini city that is our massive hotels. You're, once tourism picks up or if it doesn't pick up, the hotel is running itself. When you're a standalone, it is on that exact word, stand alone. It's not as if you're in the hotel and things aren't going as well as possible with sales for the food, so you're able to minimize the food cost by giving the food to house, uh, excuse me, giving the food to uh, room delivery or to another venue in the hotel to be able to save costs. Or if your staff is minimal, you can move them around to the different outlets. When you're a standalone, you are on your own. So moving forward, I honestly think that we will get some superstars as standalone, but most of the options are going to be safe in the hotels that are large enough to be able to support multiple outlets. Fantastic. And when they do that, they need to contact you. For anybody who's here and they want to get in contact with you to see how they can move forward, what's the best way to do that? Um, you can find our website at www.chefbema.com or if you'd like to come up afterwards, I'm happy to share our business card um, as well as some free advice. Fantastic. Ladies and gents, I'm sure you've been as thrilled uh, and intrigued by the inner workings of the industry as I've been. Please put your hands together for Chef Vanessa Bema. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Brilliant. Now, before you leave, I want to invite you to experience something incredibly special. Mo! I'm going to do it, but I'm going to bring him on because we have an audience. We have a little bit of time, and this gentleman is a superstar. He's a legend all the way from South Africa. He's going to do something that hasn't been seen in this room properly before, and so... It's called Magic. Please put your hands together for the incredible Mo Magic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He's actually he's, he's telling the truth that I didn't know because if I knew, I would have been mic'd up. So do you want, do you want to take? Do you want to put a mic? You go and get a mic on. Can we put a mic on him? Okay. I'm, I'm going to do that. Now, for everybody who doesn't know about Magic, um, it's one of those things that we thought, well, how could it fit in with an event like this? And then when we, when we met Mo, it was very simple because... The doom and gloom that many people have been talking about with the industry and where we're going to go and the pulling out of hair is alleviated when you've got somebody who can just do some incredible stuff. And I think that the magic that we're going to see from Mo in a few moments' time is not that different, hopefully, from what we're going to see uh, from the conversations that we've been having uh, in this room of Chef Talks and the possibilities of what people are going to be coming up with uh, with a future disruption of the food and hospitality industry. So I'm not sure what, when he does come up here whether he's going to be looking for volunteers, but when he does it, he does it with a very COVID-aware um, um, look of doing stuff and, and getting people up here. I love it. I can't get enough of it. I love watching it. I love being involved in it. I'm sure the same will be for, true for you as well. So for you guys, I'm, I'm just going to check with a quick survey. How many of you are based in Dubai? One, and two, three, four. And how many of you are visiting Dubai just for this? Okay, wonderful. And how many of you didn't put your hands up because you're sort of just out of prison and you're not sure if you're going back again? I just being, I'm joking with that. I think we're just about ready. Are you good to go? Yes. All right, we're going to do this one more time. Have you got the cameras ready? Yeah, well, uh, we're good to go. I'm here. Thank Time you, to Dave. show this. Put your hands together once again for Mo Magic! Very, very cool. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know you've had a long day. It's day two. Lots of fun, lots of activity here. But as we, uh, we wind down for the day, I thought I'd take... Um, now that uh, Dave has invited me here, I thought I'd just take uh, maybe two or three minutes to show you a quick little piece of magic. Now, first things first. Some, some of you might be looking at me and thinking, the world's largest food and hospitality and ex exhibition and magic, how does that work together? Well, if you think about it, all the best chefs take time, they prepare, and they present the most gorgeous meals. It's the same with magic. When prepared well and served with elegance and class, both give you a joyful experience. Now, being a magician, I'm originally from South Africa. I get to travel around the world. But traveling around the world, the most popular question I get is, Mo, what can you do with money? So I was recently in the States. And uh, earlier, I was on the other stage where we interviewed uh, uh, the chief 
marketing officer of Microsoft who's from New York. So he, he had a couple of bills, and he said, well, what can you do with these bills? So that's 10, that's 20, that's 30, that's 40 US dollars. And I say bills because in the States they say bills. In South Africa and Dubai we call these notes. Now you, sir, in front of me in a loud, clear voice, I'm not going to come too close to you, but I want you to make sure that these are exactly what they appear to be. Four notes of 10 each, yes? yes. Excellent. What's your name? Adnan. Adnan, I want you to shout out in a clear voice. If I could do absolutely anything with these $40, what would impress you? Make it disappear. That's a fancy way of saying give it to you, yes? OK, one person's impressed with your joke. However, watch this. Can we get a tighter shot there, George? I want people to see this on the screen. I want you to be able to see the 10 right here. The, the bills or the notes will never leave your sight. If I just wave them just like so, you see they change at my fingertips to $100, $200, $300, 400 and that's usually where the crowd goes wild. But I guess stun silence is equally acceptable. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you, ma'am, your name? Yes. Ariana. Mariana. Mariana, would you be so kind as to go to the microphone, please, for just two minutes? That's one last thing, and then we can call it a day. Mariana, where are you joining us from? From Sweden. Oh, a, a pleasure. Which part of Sweden? In Stockholm. Excellent, excellent. I must introduce you to uh, one of the, the members from the DWTC here. His name is Oscar. He's from Sweden as well. Do you know Oscar? No. Excellent. Well, I'll just introduce you later. <laughs> now, <clears throat> yesterday and today, we've had the opportunity to learn from some of the most exciting and innovative chefs. And on the, uh, in Hall 2, today we've been learning about marketing. Marketing food, marketing what we do here. So we've been learning secrets from chefs, from marketers, and I thought now, how about I give you a secret of magic? Now, I know Adnan's going to ask me, how did I change those hundreds, $10 bills to $100 bills? So I'm going to show you a quick trick. If you like it, if they like it, I'll teach you how it's done. OK. Now, <clears throat> what's your interest in, this, uh, in uh, Gulf food? Are you, into, are you in uh, personal business, company business? Uh, we're buying food to the schools, to Sweden, and uh, to company. Excellent. Now, you know, all good food, you take different ingredients, you put them together in a special way, you apply the techniques, and you get something beautiful. Yes. Now, think of a deck of cards as ingredients. 52 different ingredients, each card having a different value, different shape. Now, because we are in a COVID world, as David said, I'm going to change it up a, a little bit. Ordinarily, I'd give you these deck, this deck of cards, I tell you to look at them. We can look at them on the screen. They are fairly well mixed. And I'd ask you to shuffle them. But now, Mariana, Mariana, I can't give that to you for your safety, for my safety. So I will mix them up. I want you to say stop wherever you feel comfortable. Stop. Excellent. Now, at this point, it's OK if I see the cards, because we're going to take one of these ingredients and make it super special. As I drop the cards, you say stop for me, please. Stop. Excellent. I'll cut the card right there. Do you have any idea the value, the color, the suit of the card that you've chosen? No. OK, well, let's see. Adnan, can you see from there? The two of spades. I'll show it to everybody on the screen. Two of spades. At this point, it's like a card like any other. I want you to make it unique. So when I ask you to think of good food, what's the first word that comes into your mind? Liquor. Say again. <laughs> the black liquor. Black liquor. Yeah. OK. So I'm going to write here black liquor. Now, at this point, you didn't know this morning you'd be thinking of this. No. You didn't know you'd meet me, Mo Magic, the magician here at Gulf Food, would ask you to do this. No. So this card is unlike any card in the world because it's got your unique words on it. This is why. It's the one ingredient that stands out from every other ingredient. Now, again, just like with the notes, I want you to watch me very carefully. The um, cards will not leave the frame of the screen. All I do is I take the card, and we'll lose it somewhere near the middle. Now, I want you to watch this. It goes in the middle. And this is where it gets exciting, Ariana. All these uh, 
each chef has their different nuance, different things. They, they'd like to do things a little differently. Even myself as a magician, I don't like to shuffle cards normally. I do it a bit differently. Watch this from the side. Did you see that, Ariana? Do you have yeah. any idea what the shuffle is called? No. <laughs> it's called showing off, man. Okay. <laughs> now, in that motion, the magic is done. One card, your card, the two of spades has vanished. It's turned invisible, gone up my sleeve, gone across my chest, went right here. Let's zoom out, George, please, so we can see my pocket. It reappears right here in my pocket. Now, at this point, I see some raised eyebrows, but Ariana, you're not too convinced. You're unsure about that, so I'm going to show you that that card is indeed the two of spades with black liquor. Now, I told you I'd teach you how it's done. Would you like to know how it's done? That was a performance. Yes? This is how it's done, but please don't tell anybody. It's our little secret. You can show them, you can share them the trick, you can spread the joy, but don't reveal the trick. What I did is get a, a wide shot now, please, George. Thank you. I took the card, I told you the two of spades, I made it invisible. I told you it went to crop up, across, and into my pocket, but that's not exactly how I did it. I used a technique where you take the card and you place the card on your palm. Now, if you're watching me carefully, you can see the card through the fingertips, but if I were to do it in a normal gesture like this, where I take it, at this point, Adnan, you can't see the card. Mariana, you can't see the card, no. which is a perfect opportunity for me to squeeze and then make your card disappear. <laughs> now, Mariana, for 50 points, where do you think your signed card is? I don't know. <laughs> it's back in the pocket. You, is that, you say your pocket. I don't even know your name. You're asking for advanced things, sir. What's your name? Nice to meet you, sir. Watch. Right here in the pocket. Please give Mariana, Adnan, and that gentleman a round of applause. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for making time to be here at Gulf Food. But, sir, just for you to finish off. Oh, David, you can come, come, come. No, come no, up, I'm come enjoying up, it. I'm just Are you enjoying it? it? Yeah, please. Now, watch this. We'll take the cards. If I just give the cards a little squeeze. See a bit of smoke from the hands. Your card comes to the top of the deck, but every other card is inconsequential because the rest of the pack changes to a block of glass right there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for day two of Gulf at Gulf Foods here with Chef Talks. And of course, David, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Put your hands together, Mo Magic! Tonya's worth staying around, not just me there. Brilliant. Mo will be around, by the way. And also, uh, Mo's relatively new to Dubai, so we're looking for more opportunities for you to connect with Mo. He does great stuff online for parties as well as doing stuff physically just like that, so it's absolutely brilliant. Um, right at this point, we're just about to close this room. We're very welcome to stay around for it, by the way. We will be continuing same time tomorrow. Around about 11 o'clock, we start our first chef talks. We've got a different set of chefs and experts every single day. We love your participation. We love your opportunity to hear your questions. But just seeing you here with the smiles behind the masks is more than enough for us. So thank you so much for your time that you spent with us. I really hope you enjoyed all the different conversations we had with our many experts today. I wish you all very, very best. Stay safe. Have an amazing Gulf food. And we'll be back same time tomorrow. Thank Thank you. And so that's it, it's come to an end. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure being here at the Chef Talks. We've had incredible conversations all the way through. Everything from how to set up your dark kitchen to how to improve your life by dropping the sugar and just being more healthy to also <laughs> straight after that, how to become a pastry chef and make cakes for everybody. 
we looked at how to create an award-winning restaurant and get it launched and also the best of Dubai a brand new book involving about 30 to 40 of the top chefs creating a community with the awards due later on in the year and that was just the beginning of the day so much to go through we'll be back with the next of our chef talks make sure you join us or even better if you can do come down and catch it live here at Dubai World Trade Center and Convention Center it's Gulf food these are the chef talks and I'm off to get some dinner. Take care. Bye bye. The brand new you program is based on the 10 rules that I've been sharing with the biggest names across the planet. <music> 10 mind programming presuppositions using NLP and hypnosis, life coaching and counseling techniques, all bringing together emotional intelligence and empathy to empower people to believe that they can do what they truly need to do to get themselves to brand new successes. This incredibly interesting and interactive presentation guarantees they start thinking differently from the moment we begin. Firstly, you have to get outside of your comfort zone. Once you can do that, you can do anything. Most people don't know. They have all the tools, all the tricks, all the abilities and all the skill sets to be able to move forward. Success changes for everybody and it's always a work in progress. The 10 rules of success are all presuppositions that when taken in context can give you the ability to take any situation, however dire and disappointing, however depressed and challenging it is, and find a simple way of getting your way forward. But it's not just me in front of a giant PowerPoint screen. There's also a ton of fun with interactive videos that they will love. Some of them are really cute. Some put their lives really into perspective. How do you keep yourself psychologically healthy in space? It's also interactive with lots of thrills, spills and laughs. Yes. They also get a special gift, something to reprogram and help them on their journey. The brand new you, NLP audio program. My name is Dave Crane. We've never had a time where so many people feel so lonely, so isolated, so helpless, and so scared. Worried about their jobs, worried about their future, worried about their family, worried about their health. That's why I've created this audio. As a hypnotherapist, I have helped many, many people to create success in their business life, in their personal life, and in their emotional stability. Imagine being able to talk to the very best of you in the past, the most successful version of you, and getting them to advise you on how you need to move forward, and being able to talk to the future version of you who's already lived through this and had the success that you could have dreamed of, who's telling you what they did next. This audio is designed to give you both of them as your mentors and to help you create a brand new you. Enjoy and please share with those who you know need it as well. My name is Dave Crane.